welcome you all to the 15th meeting of the Committee for the Economy. The meeting is now open to the public. Um, obviously, due to ongoing, ongoing safeguarding measures in place um, in regards to COVID-19, some members will attend today's meeting. Nobody's on teleconference today. Christopher <laughs> will be here eventually. Um, some of today's witnesses uh, will <laughs> brief the committee via teleconference. Um, the meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablet devices by pushing F4 on their devices. Um, <laughs> apologies today, we have apologies from, from Stuart Dixon. Um, item number two then on the um, agenda is the draft minutes. Um, they are on page five of the pack and a record of decisions at page four of the table papers um, for the decisions we took by correspondence from last week's meeting. Are our members content that the minutes and record of decision are accurate? Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there are no items of chairperson's business. Um, so then we will go on to... Item number seven, which is matters arising. Um, there is a ministerial letter at page 187 um, of your pack on amendments to exit day references in the Northern Ireland Societas Europea Self <laughs> SE Employee Involvement Regulations. The Minister has agreed that the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy undertake an amendment to two SIs affecting the European Public Limited Liability Company. Involvement Northern Ireland Regulations 2009 on behalf of the Department. While employment law is a transferred matter, the Minister has stated her reasons for doing so are to avoid gaps in the timing of the amendments with those of BES and to minimise resources needed, considering the likely impact is small and that this um, the, that bundled this way are all more e easily treated by those wishing to do so. Do members have any actions to note on that? Okay. Noted. Um, then page 189 of your pack, a departmental response on adequate provision of protective equipment for workers and customers in its recovery guidance. Um, do members have any actions that they want to suggest in relation to that? Uh, sure, it's something we want to cover with the LRA and they come in later on. Yeah, yeah and I think the important thing is, is we get back to normality. The small businesses, we talked about this last week, the small businesses are even given some financial support to be able to put in the protective measures and the proper mm -hmm. equipment. And obviously some advice on hygiene, I think, is important. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for the small to micro businesses, Michael McQuillan mentioned it last week in his uh, presentation. I think it's important that it's picked up somewhere, perhaps done through councils or whatever, but yeah. local enterprises perhaps are, are the equivalent. I think it is important that we, we action that. It's helpful. It, it, within the letter that we mentioned last week, we have Silas and Nilga on next Tuesday. We're having a meeting next Tuesday. Okay, so we, we can pick that up further? Yes, it would have been Monday, but Monday's a bank holiday. So You're getting worse. Well, we have to get them in soon, so Tuesday was right. We will send details on, but they'll be able to start talking about maybe the council. Good. Sorry, Chad. No problem. Um, okay, then we, we will pick that up further. Um, item number three then, um, on page 192 of your pack, there is a, a summary of outstanding departmental issues arising from meetings. Um, members have queried a number of outstanding responses during informal discussions last week. Um, do members have any actions they wish to note? Just Chair, I mentioned the North West 200. Chair, the, the letters went out to Good. the Department. Ministers last week, so we wrote to the, the Economy Minister, we wrote to the Communities Minister. Um, no responses as yet, but I wouldn't have expected them so quickly, so hopefully we'll get that turned around fairly fast. In terms of just while we're talking about that, the letter we sent to uh, all of the MPs, the Ministers, the Chair of the Treasury Select Committee, um, four of our MPs have replied. The, uh, Treasury Select Committee has acknowledged, haven't done anything back from the ministers yet, but basically everyone who has replied is, is pursuing the issue um, with as much force as we are, so um, with, with any luck that will be resolved sooner rather than later. Yep, okay. Um, then moving on to item number four, on page 195 of your pack is a survey carried out by the Federation of Small Businesses on the impact um, of COVID-19. Do members have any issues that they want to, to highlight in respect of that, or is this something that we, we should come back to further again? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, um, and then at page 197 of your pack, there's correspondence from the Association of British Insurers following the committee's reference to trade credit insurance at last week's meeting. Um, obviously, we have also asked to, to pick up with ABI and with the SEA, and we've, yeah, um, we will be asking those. Chair with both, so we, we try and get briefings done with them as well. Okay, do members have anything else that they want to raise in relation to that at this point? Chair, it's just one thing. I had a conference call with most of the providers of childcare facilities and after-school clubs in East Antrim last week. One of the issues that rose out of that was that they were being told by their insurance providers, for the most part, that they're not going to be covered if they reopen until that gets reassessed and they're not indemnified. Those that have remained open have been covered by government here with a top-up to indemnify them, but that has not been rolled out to those who seek to open. Obviously, to get the economy back up and running, it is essential that we have somewhere for the young people to go yeah. when their parents are at work. But if they can't open and aren't protected, then it's going to cause a complete logjam when we're in that situation to get back. So if that's something that could be raised and yeah. how either we are looking at that or how the insurance companies are looking at that, that would be mm. very beneficial. Yeah, I'm sure we, that's been quite a confused issue. Um, it's cross departmental. Oh, yeah. I'd love a coffee, that would be really nice. Just a we have a look into that. Mm. Yeah, we do. Uh, do. And that's something that we can raise with, yeah. with yeah. them as well. <laughs> okay. Um, thank the minister for for coming along oh, to geez. us this morning. So we'll go back to um, item number four on the the CLAR. Um, there is a readout from the the call uh, between myself and the minister at page twelve of the pack. Uh, at page. Um, 13 and 19, there are letters that we have um, sent to the Minister from, from the Committee on the 6th and 13th of May. Um, and there is a departmental paper at page 8 of the table papers summarising the most up-to-date information for COVID-19 based queries from members. Um, so I'd just like to welcome the Minister to our, our meeting this morning and um, I'll invite the Minister first of all to make a statement and then we'll open it up to uh, members for questions. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm presuming, the, sorry for my technological um, ignorance, I'm presuming everyone else is on the, the mm. call in. No, all the members, apart from Christopher, are here. He will be joining us at some point. Ah, right. Okay. So okay. Well, good to see everyone and glad that everyone is well and healthy. That's the absolutely main thing in the, the strange and terrible times we live in. So. Again, i um, pleased to update you on all the work um, that we've been doing in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's only been uh, three weeks since I last was at the committee, but quite a lot has happened since then. And that includes more deaths from coronavirus, um, along with the grief that this creates for family and friends uh, of each and every individual. Um, I have always said that this is first and foremost a health emergency and the focus remains on saving lives, but we are also living through an unprecedented economic and social crisis. It is on the economic dimension where I must focus my time and uh, energy as the economy minister, but not lose sight of how social health and economic inequalities collide and compound. The first key point I would stress is that I remain determined to do all that I can to support businesses and workers across Northern Ireland. My department is currently distributing four hundred and ten million in grants to thousands of businesses. The new forty million micro business hardship fund has just been established, and I am happy that we can provide vital assistance to more companies, including some of the social enterprise sector. We will continue to do all that we can to support as many businesses as we can, as quickly as we can, and within the limits of the budget that is available to us. As of yesterday, 21,172 payments of 10,000 have been issued to small business. A further 2,065 grants have been issued to businesses in retail, tourism, leisure and hospitality sectors who applied for the 25K scheme. If more money was to become available, we would seek to help more businesses and fill in the gaps that remain. The grant funding is making a real difference. It is helping companies to survive right now, to plan ahead and to keep their hopes alive of a bright future again at the other side of the fight against the virus. Alongside our grant schemes, Rates Relief, the Bank Lending Scheme, Job Retention Scheme and Support for the Self-Employed have also been essential. 
It is positive news that the Chancellor is extending the furlough scheme until the end of October. This will allow companies to keep staff in work while they plan ahead. And this scheme is central in efforts to minimise the long-term damage to our economy. I know we will not be able to save every job, but we are working hard to save as many as we can. Starting to work on the recovery phase is essential, and that is where much of my work has been focused since my last appearance before the committee. I know you have received a briefing from Belfast, Londonderry, Newry and Causeway Chambers of Commerce that the issue of the impact uh, on tourism was highlighted by them. Just last year, tourism was a one billion uh, industry, employing 65,000 people. It won't be the same on the other side of this crisis, but we must look to new opportunities. I have set up the Tourism Recovery Working Group and I chair its steering group, comprising key sectors and stakeholders. There is an obvious determination among all involved to work together to bring about recovery. I am also re-establishing the Economic Advisory Group that was previously in place to advise my predecessors. It will provide expert advice on our economic strategy as well as our recovery. It will also help us to identify global market opportunities and ensure that we understand the sectors to focus on and build on our world-class reputation in areas such as cybersecurity, fintech and digital startups. And I was really delighted uh, yesterday um, to announce 65 jobs from a new investment business in Belfast in cybersecurity. Um, and just diverting away from my statement, I spoke um, uh, to them yesterday, strangest job announcement I've ever had via Zoom. Um, some folk in Boston um, and me at home and others in the department um, and Invest in I, and they cited two critical issues for their investment in Northern Ireland. And that was uh, the quality and talent of the people and the um, masters in cybersecurity that is offered by our universities. So clearly investing in skills and people will be key to economic recovery. In that context, um, I've been tasked by the executive to set out more detail on the steps we've been taking to get our economy moving again in time for the next lockdown review by the executive on the 28th of May. The longer we face into damaging economic impacts, the greater the risk of long-term scarring on our economy and society. Conversely, the more of our economy that we can restart safely and adjust to the new normal now, the less likely it is that we will be facing large-scale redundancies in the near future. Countries across the world have been planning the delicate and tricky task of coming out of lockdown. This means carefully lifting restrictions to reduce social and economic damage while keeping the R rate under control. In a similar way, the Executive has set out a phased, five-stage plan for Northern Ireland moving out of lockdown. Decisions taken will be based on evidence and will also take account of our unique circumstances. Manufacturing and construction activities are already permitted here under the existing regulations. A number have restarted as they can safely managing, manage social distancing within their workplaces. Some retail businesses have adapted too, and we can learn from them. Care and thought will need to be taken with reopening the other parts of the retail sector. Garden centres reopened at the start of the week. Some sports, drive-in churches, cinemas are also now permitted. Hospitality, including bars and restaurants, is likely to be towards the end of the reopening phases and will need additional support. I recognise that many businesses may also need specific guidance on their workplaces. As such, I have asked the Engagement Forum to consider the guidance recent, recently published by uh, UK Government and to assess whether this would improve on the practical advice we already have in place to help our employers, employees and the self-employed understand how to work safely during the coronavirus pandemic. We need to build on what is best in our economy and focus on the areas where we can be most competitive in a global market. Yesterday I announced the Boston firm Sigligant is creating 65 new cybersecurity jobs in Belfast. This is welcome news. 
at this challenging time and an endorsement of Northern Ireland's growing reputation in the field. None of us should underestimate the enormity of the challenge ahead, but other small economies are reacting well and preparing for the future, and I am determined that Northern Ireland will do the same. We will all have to get used to new business models and new working arrangements, less travel, more remote and flexible working, less FDI and a heavier reliance on local supply chains. We should be using our size to our advantage. We should be agile and decisive when new opportunities present themselves. Business needs to adapt quickly, as it always does. Companies across Northern Ireland are already adapting to the challenges COVID-19 has thrown into their path. They have made changes to their working practices and physical structures to enable people to remain in work within key and priority sectors. They are producing much needed personal protection equipment for health workers in hospitals, care homes and community settings. And while many people will continue to work from home for the foreseeable future, businesses are beginning to plan for the gradual return of more staff to their workplaces. The safety of workers is and always must be a top priority. The Engagement Forum, chaired by the Labour Relations Agency, has been doing invaluable work. This work was well ahead of other areas of the United Kingdom, and they will continue to advise as we plan ahead. The Health and Safety Executive has also been playing a very important role in working to address unsafe working practices where this has been needed. Since the 1st of April until the 19th of May, it has received 771 complaints. A further 309 complaints were passed on to councils who had the appropriate um, responsibility. In the past two weeks, there have been 52 site visits conducted. Some have required follow-up visit, uh, uh, visits and others um, have been resolved. Under the four uh, city and growth deals, we will support new projects in innovation, in the digital economy, in skills and in tourism. The executive is match funding uh, 562 million for the city and growth deals and 55 million for inclusive futures fund. It will also provide up to an additional 100 million for complementary projects in other areas outside the northwest. I welcome this injection of crucial funding for all regions of Northern Ireland, and which will boost our economy over the next decade. Support just doesn't come in the form of money or grants. My department has also partnered uh, with Open University to offer a range of free training courses to help people across Northern Ireland improve their skills and well-being. The Skills Focus programme is also available for small and medium enterprises at no cost. This offers free upskilling by further education colleges for staff, including those who are furloughed, so that they can return to the workplace upskilled. I very much appreciate the support of the committee at this time. It is essential that we continue to work closely together as we move forward and plan for the future. Businesses here have withstood the toughest of times in our past, and I have no doubt they will do the same again. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, for, for your, your statement and for, for laying out all of the work that has been going on. Um, um, obviously, as you've said yourself, this is an, an unprecedented health crisis, first and foremost, but obviously the economic impact is huge. Um, and I think it is very important that we are now in the phase of where we're, we're looking forward to the type of recovery that we want to see and obviously we all want to see a recovery that's fair and, and more equal and, and, and builds I suppose, <coughs> on some of the sectors that have expanded during this crisis as well as supporting those that um, have, have obviously suffered. Um, and I think you know, some of the announcements around cyber security are, are very important because obviously that's a, a sector that has expanded the digital economy. Um, the opportunity, I suppose, to build on the green economy. There is um, a press today that global carbon emissions have dropped by 17% during the, the, um, the, the lockdown. So obviously there, there's, you know, there's lessons to be learned from all of this as well. And I think there's real opportunities to look at how we can, can move forward in terms of looking at the green economy. And obviously we have the um, new decade, new approach commitments around a green new deal and um, tackling the climate emergency and all of those things that we want to build on in terms of the economic recovery. Um, obviously, you have mentioned yourself 
um, the need to support local supply chains in terms of the recovery as well. Um, global supply chains obviously being very much impacted by, by the lockdown. I think there's a real opportunity in terms of developing the all-island economy. Um, and that has been highlighted by the likes of CBI and IBEC and obviously um, Intertrade Ireland last week when we, they were in with the committee. Um, in terms of um, some of the issues that we would like to deal with today, obviously the grant support has been really, really important to businesses and many have, um, as you've outlined there in terms of the numbers who've received the 10K and 25K, have received really important intervention. Um, the hardship fund obviously was announced at the weekend and there was frustration and bewilderment um, amongst some um, who had expected to be included in it, including the social enterprises and sole traders. And obviously these issues have been highlighted over the past couple of days. Um, I think that, you know, I, that we really need to look at how those people can be supported also. Social enterprises with charitable status, they are still businesses and um, they are competing obviously with other businesses and very much um, feel that they should be included in, in the, the business support and the same for sole traders. Some of them obviously aren't able to access any support. Um, they aren't able to access the self-employed income support scheme um, because of the way that they set themselves up. And obviously also there are the, the newly self-employed who haven't been able to file a tax return for 2018-19 and aren't able to access it either. Um, and those people obviously are the, the type of um, businesses that we want to be encouraging to, to grow and to, to expand in the time ahead. You know, very entrepreneurial people doing really good work. Um, and I think that it is important that we look to do whatever we can in terms of supporting those. Um, there's a few other issues that I'd like to pick up on you with, but maybe you would like to, to comment around those first of all. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I think that it's really important to build on really strong areas of the economy. Um, so that we have some really strong uh, areas um, around uh, fintech, around the digital economy and so on. And just last week I um, had a very interesting and informative call uh, with Catalyst um, about young entrepreneurs um, in, in the digital economy. Um, and we hope uh, to reach out more to those young people, uh, many of whom have been in significant detail, um, and we're following up with some of that. I also agree that this is uh, an opportunity not just to restart our economy, um, but um, reprioritise and regrow our economy. And as such, I see um, a huge amount of opportunity um, within the green economy. Um, and I was talking to um, one of our, my counterparts in London last week about exactly that and how um, the innovation that is already within Northern Ireland can actually um, be really used um, in, in that green economy. I can't uh, say a lot about it at the minute, but there are some very exciting pieces of work that we will be able to bring forward um, around the green economy. Um, and particularly, again, um, I received from very good news last night, which will be announced and soon, uh, around uh, those who have uh, been entrepreneurial, far-sighted, and have gone out um, and sought support for their work um, in developing uh, the green economy. So really, really important, an opportunity not just to build on what we have, um, and to reach out for what we have, but to also refocus um, on, on some of the things and refocus the economy in some of these ways. So, and I think that that will be growing, uh, have a growing importance for um, the restart programmes that national government are actually going to, to bring forward as well. So really very important. Um, glad uh, you mentioned that. Um, and as I say, my call with Catalyst uh, was very important. So, in terms of the grants, and, and excuse me, I'm just going to bring up the absolute figures um, um, for, for the, 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 the grants. So, I gave you um, the, the figures for the, the payment um, of the, the grants so far. Um, we are still working our way through those, um, but uh, today is the last day that, they've be, that they will be open. Um, they've been open for uh, quite a number of weeks. Uh, the 25k less than, than the, the 40k, but are the 10k. But um, we, at the initial start of these applications, we see a huge um, number of applications, but they have been tailing off, which sort of indicates to us that, that we're probably um, at, at, at a max uh, in relation to that. So um, 
we will be doing um, our best to wind up uh, both those and make sure that everybody is paid as quickly as possible. At the start of the 25k grant scheme, I promised um, that we would not wait um, any length of time uh, to get these schemes out and are this money out and to get this paid for um, to local businesses who are considering uh, con considerable hardship. And we have been doing that. Um, so we are, are, are proceeding apace in relation to that. The Hardship Fund um, was announced uh, at the weekend. There will be further details around this um, and a go-live date. Um, I was hoping for today, but a go-live date, um, and I will update the committee uh, as soon as I get the absolute hard time uh, for the go-live date for the Hardship Grant. Um, so we're, we're working apace on that. Um, in relation uh, to the two areas of people that uh, you asked me about, so um, social enterprises um, in relation to the hardship grant, are, yes, so social enterprises um, who are not um, charities um, will be able to apply for the hardship grant and there are lots of those around and they, they will be able to apply as long as they meet the criteria. That, is, that is, is not an issue. As I spoke to you on Monday, um, I have uh, no ideological real um, role in this. It's the practicalities of how we administer the grant. The Minister for Communities, Deidre Hargey, is bringing out a uh, charities grant. And after the work, the work, there was a considerable amount of work done between uh, economy and communities where it was decided that probably in order to avoid duplication and in order to avoid people uh, not knowing where to apply, that those who were charities then would apply to the Charities Fund. Um, there is considerable pressure on both of these funds, um, but it was to avoid duplication. Um, I asked my officials uh, to go back and look at that, um, and everyone has informed me that, um, that in order to, to achieve the aims that we want, to get money out quickly, to avoid duplication, to avoid cross-checking, um, that, that that is the road we should go. Um, and I suppose the second factor in that is that the Charities Fund still has a little bit of time to go until it, it becomes live. So it's, it's really, it's not anything other than we want to avoid duplication, we want to get bit money out to businesses as quickly as we can. In relation to the target groups um, for the um, Hardship Fund, um, we have targeted businesses um, which have um, one uh, to nine employees. Um, that probably is a target group of around 30,000 businesses, which will be um, somewhat uh, reduced because some of those businesses may already have received money through different schemes. So if you have applied for the 10 or the 25k grant, you've been uh, successful in those applications, then um, that would mean that you wouldn't be able to apply to the hardship scheme. Really, all that we have been trying to do is to ensure that we work within the envelope of funding that is available to us um, and that we work um, to ensure that we get to as many people as we possibly can in as quick a time frame as we can. And that's been the principle that's guiding what we're doing. So the, the, the decision was then taken to um, target one to nine employees. Do you want me to go on about this now, or, or will I respond to other? No, go on ahead. Or, are you okay? Sorry, I'm aware that I'm maybe going on a bit too long, so I don't want to, to hog anybody's time. So I asked um, um, the, the department to do some figures in relation to this. Because um, we obviously work within a funding envelope. And can I just say also that that funding envelope um, of uh, just over 400 million for grants. And yesterday with the announcement, the executives consent and announcement um, to the extension of rates relief brings to over 700 million uh, the amount of direct support that will be going to businesses in Northern Ireland. That probably leaves businesses, and I, I know that businesses are in terrible hardship. I understand that, but that leaves the level of support uh, as one of the highest in the United Kingdom to businesses um, from the, the work that we have done. And we will continue 
to reassess those. And of course, the next uh, opportunity will be uh, the June monitoring round, and we will continue to keep an eye on this and reassess um, as we go along. So, um, for example, if we were to take all of the businesses in Northern Ireland that are not eligible for the hardship fund and um, provide 10k to those businesses, that would cost another 890 million. Um, if we were to um, provide uh, 10k to registered businesses with not or one employee, we would be looking for another 350 million. So I, I think that you can see the scale of the need out there, and that what we have done is to try to prioritise um, for, from where we are. So I, and I, I throw those figures out just so that we see the scale of the need. I'm not diminishing anyone's need or the dire circumstances that are in it. Um, and we will continue uh, to give priority and, and work at trying to get help out to different sectors. Um, but I think that that demonstrates the scale of where we're at. I apologise if I've left anything. Oh, sorry, the newly self-employed. Um, yes, again, and um, after a phone call on Monday, I did go and look at the scheme that Scotland currently have for those who are newly self-employed. These tend to be younger people, people who are entrepreneurial, people who have seen a way of establishing a business, growing a business for them, themselves and their families and, and so on. Um, and again, um, this is something that we will look at um, as we bring to a close the, the 2, the 10 and the 25 case scheme. Uh, but again, we have to work within the funding envelope um, that we are given. Thank you for those responses, and I know other members will be picking up on, on those issues as well. And I guess I would just reiterate around the, the social enterprises that um, are they have charitable status, but they do operate as businesses. Um, and Update, sorry, just in the hardship scheme will go live at 6 p.m. today. <laughs> that's good news. That's good news. Um, and I guess in terms of the, the self-employed, the self sole traders, it would be those specifically who haven't been able to access any other support at all that we we will be looking to be included in in this fund. And I think anything that could be done in terms of trying to identify those people would be really useful. And obviously, you have given some very high numbers of, of businesses that could potentially be involved in, in um, schemes, but I think it would be a much, much smaller cohort that would mm -hmm. be likely to be falling into the specific category of no support and being sole trader. But mm -hmm. um, we will look at, um, I'm sure other members will be picking up on that as well. Um, I, I would just like to pick up on one other thing, I suppose, before I open up to other members. Um, obviously, the, this crisis will have a particular economic impact on young people. Um, we have seen a number of reports now in relation to that, including one published yesterday by the Resolution Foundation, um, predictions of up to 25% youth unemployment. Um, very, very concerning times. Obviously, young people were for the brunt to some extent of the, the previous economic crisis um, and have ended up you know, facing another crisis in, in less than 10 years. Um, so I think it's something that we really need to put a real focus on in terms of our um, response. <coughs> and um, welcome the announcement yesterday of the 1.4 million towards the, the Student Hardship Fund. I think that is going to be very important in terms of supporting students. Um, I know we previously had a figure, I think, of 2.5 million that, that you spoke about in terms of the Hardship Fund. And I was just wondering, is the department um, going to direct support towards the hardship as on top of the 1.4 million? Um, and the type of engagement that we need to have between um, young people and the department between the students' unions, I know is something that they have raised with us about wanting to be involved in terms of the planning um, and engagement uh, <coughs> with officials in terms of the economic response as well. But I think that in the time ahead, it's going to be really important that we have um, opportunities in terms of training and skills for young people specifically, and obviously for people of all ages as well, but to help those who are perhaps coming out of university or college and where previously there would have been jobs in retail and hospitality, those are the sectors most impacted um, at the minute, and there aren't the same opportunities for, for young people to have employment. Um, so if you maybe would like to, to comment around some of that. No, I um, absolutely agree with you. I think that um, some of the analysis of the unemployment statistics from yesterday would indicate um, that those people who were 
absolutely immediately impacted um, by the pandemic were the young, those on zero hour contracts uh, or on part time work. And, and I think that that's reflected in the claims for universal credit and uh, the statistics that came out yesterday. So I am absolutely cognizant um, of that particular issue. Um, and, and I know as we um, go through this and talk about economic recovery, I want to say some other things around that, um, but um, absolutely cognizant of that. Um, so yes, I, I had thought of, of John in mind whenever we were talking about the hardship fund, because he has faithfully asked me about the hardship fund at every opportunity. Um, yes, um, a further allocation was made um, in terms of our student support. Um, and hardship fund. We are currently in the department looking at uh, reprioritisation and the June monitoring round, and I would hope to add to that um, so that we can get that back out um, and into the, the universities. All right, we were going to give Christopher his first question yes. because he didn't get to ask one the last day you were in, but he's not here <laughs> in a minute, so he will be along shortly. I'm he's probably. having a crisis. Yes, okay, so. <laughs> Junaid? Thank you very much, Minister, um, for that briefing. Um, it was very informative, and it would be remiss of me not to thank you also uh, in relation to the executive announcement on Monday regarding McGee. And I know there's still work to be done, um, yes. but yes. there is a, an imminent deadline, uh, and obviously the first intake of students um, is September 2021, according to the announcement. So um, we're delighted about that, uh, and the whole city is is, is definitely celebrating it. That good good news story. Uh, and hopefully, um, whatever work has to be done now in the next couple of weeks, it will, will, everything will go through. Uh, and, and great news about the cyber, um, the, the cyber mm. jobs, the 65 jobs, brilliant. And, and we've got a real cluster and niche there mm -hmm. uh, in Northern Ireland, and we need to, to grow mm. and, and develop that. Just, uh, I suppose, picking up uh, where Kiva left off in relation to young people, um, that is a real concern. I suppose for all of us in the economy going forward because we've got a lot of school leavers people that are joining the job market for the very first time either just graduating or leaving school uh, uh, and their prospects are very very bleak and i was just really wondering um you know what in the recovery the economic recovery program would you envisage that we should do collectively you know as the department and particularly thinking about you know, blending apprenticeship programs, supporting employers to take in uh, trainees and apprentices. Uh, and, and probably at, at this time, we'll have to probably fund these positions because um, it is really necessary that we get those young people uh, into work very, very quickly. We can't afford to lose the, that generation. So, uh, you know, I do think we have to really think hard and be innovative. Uh, and I'm really, you know, uh, welcome the news that you were talking to Catalyst regarding mm -hmm. young entrepreneurs. I've been talking to the business community at home as well. And, um, you know, we, we've got um, an education advisory group and I've run it past them about how we can get a blend of training programs with our, you know, uh, further education colleges. Uh, with our employers and with our young people so that we get them into work quickly so that they are not left behind. You know, this is the generation that can't afford a mortgage. This is the generation that has already taken an impact and a hit with the previous crisis and we can't afford to leave them behind. It would be a social, um, it would be a social upheaval. It, you know, Northern Ireland traditionally, how we deal with it, these type of things is the young people emigrate and get jobs elsewhere. That's not even possible for them. And as Kiva said, you know, retail hospitality, and that's not possible either. So we've got to reskill them, we've got to get them in the education and blend that with work and support the employers uh, and our further education and higher education colleges to do that. Is that some of the thought process that you are looking at within your department? See how we can actually support our young people. Because there's a mental health, and this is Mental Health Awareness Week as well, there's a mental health impact um, when we um, leave those people behind and as a future generation. Thank you. I have to say I don't disagree with anything that you said at all, Sinead. Um, <clears throat> two things are, I, I really want to focus on out of that. One, yes, the announcement uh, on the McGee Medical School was a, a good announcement. 
um, for the executive to make, a good announcement for the city, but more importantly, just a good announcement for the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, it is quite clear that we need uh, more doctors and we want more of our young people to be able to train and retrain. Um, I'm not pretending that the path ahead is easy. There is a significant amount of work uh, to do um, in relation to uh, the issues uh, around capacity of Ulster University. Uh, and the financial position of Ulster University, and there's a significant amount of work to do about that. Um, but um, we have set ourselves on a pathway, and uh, we are working um, quite hard um, on that. Um, and there will be further papers to the executive on that in, in due course. Um, so that's uh, McGee. Um, on the issue of young people, can I just say a few words on the general uh, economy and recovery um, as, as a whole? So in, in, um, in the next um, number of, of weeks, I'll be bringing forward a series of papers um, to the executive about economic recovery. Some will be more immediate, some will be um, more long term. Um, but one of the things that we've been um, asking and uh, doing some research on are um, the number of people that are furloughed, the reasons why firms uh, furloughed those people, the potential for firms to um, restructure, reorganise what happens to those workers um, who uh, have been furloughed. So we're, we're working our way through a piece of work um, around that. Um, thankfully, the extension of the furlough scheme has given us a little bit more time in order to do that. So we need to understand what's actually happening um, in the economy, um, and we're we're doing some research and work, which we hope to produce fairly soon, around that. And then that will direct the interventions that we uh, should or should need to make um, within the economy in a general sense. So that's, that's the important piece uh, to say. Um, and we will come and talk to you about that and, and share that. But it, it, it is just ongoing, all of those pieces of work. There's a, a lot of emphasis in the, in the department now on how do we recover? How do we actually reboot, reprioritize, um, get our economy up and working again? Um, I have said this often. Um, and I think it's, it's worth saying again that every month of lockdown is equivalent to a large recession of itself. And that will bring with it all of the attendant problems um, of demand, production, unemployment um, and the anxiety and stress um, that that uh, brings with us. So this, the, the, the second element of your question around that is um, how do we address young people in the middle of all of this? And you're quite right that young people suffered very, very badly in um, the 2008, 9, and the, in the years following that. Um, and in many um, countries across Europe, and where I was in the European Parliament, young people, unemployment for young people under 25 could have been 40, 50 percent of those young people's. No one wants to go back to those days. So we need to work with higher education, with further education, to ensure that we are giving opportunities to young people at all stages. And that will mean looking at the, the skills that are required in the economy, how we can encourage young people, and how we can expand training and apprenticeship places. And one of the things that we did right at the outset of the COVID-19 crisis was to actually say to training organisations, even though you don't have young people, even though you're not training them right here and now, we need you. We need you to survive. We need you to continue. And so we continued to pay for the places that those young people would have taken up. So we, we, we are keeping our training organisers in place. So I want young people, and I, I'm, I'm absolutely adamant about this, right from that young person who has found difficulty at school to that young per person who can aspire to... Uh, I don't know, a, high, a higher level apprenticeship, a degree course, or, or whatever they aspire to in life, to have opportunity. And that will mean that we will have to make a number of interventions around uh, further education, the delivery of that, um, and we, need, we want to understand the demand and the regrowth of the economy. Um, and I'm sure as this conversation continues, we'll have lots of different things to say about that. Um, Gary? 
Uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks, Minister, uh, for being with us today. And uh, also, just to pass on our thanks to uh, the Department as well, because I know that uh, whilst we might be critical in terms of uh, what needs to be done uh, and what we think should be done, we know that a huge amount of effort has been put in to get money out quickly to the businesses uh, who need it. Uh, but, but, but also, many people are working many long hours. So we just want to put on record our thanks. Uh, to, to all of them who are doing that. Uh, to move on, obviously there's been um, uh, much welcome news around the five-stage plan and, and the fact that that gives people uh, hope, and, and that's what we need uh, during these difficult times, is a bit of hope uh, around the fact that the economy will get to, to, to get to move again and the wheels will start, start turning. Um, have you any thoughts, uh, Minister, in terms of where we go next? Uh, you, you know, people obviously hairdressers. I don't know why people are obsessed with hairdressers. Well, but I, they do. Want to see, I do. Want to, Jerry. <laughs> I do. They, they want to see those open. Car caravan <laughs> parks is another uh, topical one. But but in terms of non-retail, and there's a few dodgy haircuts running about. But we'll, we'll not pass. We'll not pass judgment. But in terms of the, the non-retail as well, there's a, there's a bit of, I suppose, anxiousness to, we, we want to get going and we want to now open up our doors and, and try and get the economy moving. Is there any thoughts in terms of where we go next? Yeah. No, a, a very valid question. First of all, can I say that um, our five-stage plan is based on the science on uh, moving forward at a rate um, that keeps, um, as the Chief uh, Scientific Officer said to us last week, um, that ensures the stability of the R number. So in other words, what we don't want is for that reproductive rate to rise so that COVID-19 is spreading again uh, within the community with all of the dreadful consequences of that. Um, so it's, it's about the stability of the R number. It's about making sure people are safe. Um, and I think uh, in terms of business in the community, it's about making sure that consumers are confident when they go out um, so that they feel safe to go out uh, to shop um, and that uh, but also that they respect uh, the guidelines on social distancing um, and good um, hygiene particularly hand hygiene um, in in that area so um, in, in all of these things we want to make sure that we do things safely um, and with regard to that reproductive rate number um, that, that is so important. I personally think that the worst thing that we could do is to plough ahead regardless, as my mother used to accuse some of us of doing, um, and um, not take cognizance of the very grave health risks that there are. But the other element for the economy um, is that if we did those kind of things and if the executive were not cautious and making decisions that are finely balanced and um, really big judgments to have to make. Um, if we were not doing that um, for the economy, that would mean that we would ease restrictions only to pull them back again. Mm. And I think that would be devastating for business in Northern Ireland. And I don't want to see that happen. However, I am uh, bringing forward a series of papers um, to the executive. Um, and I do think um, that we can slowly, steadily um, reopen and re-energise our economy. We already have, for example, garden centres um, that are, are open. We have recycling centres that are open. Our supermarkets, our shops have, in, in many ways, our small shops have been heroic and, and they've done so many things in, the, in, in what were very dark times um, in, in this crisis. Um, and I think it, we need now at the next review of the regulations, um, which is at the end of May, I think it's the 28th of May, they have to be reviewed by, we would need to start thinking about how we can open uh, non-food retail. And so in other words, um, those maybe I, I, I th I'm thinking of things like um, garage forecourts, those rather, those big open outdoor things that we could do um, where um, the risk of spread is less, um, and and I think that we would need to to do that. Um, and so I'm I'm thinking about um, electrical stores. Um, I'm thinking about uh, garage forecourts, um, those car sales businesses, that type of business um, that operates um, not in terribly co close quarters, but that will give us another staging post. And on the road uh, to recovery, um, and where there's room to ensure that social distancing 
is uh, done appropriately. We understand also that businesses will need a bit of time. Um, we, we're not asking anybody or instructing anybody to do anything immediately, but that's the sort of thing that's on my mind. Um, but we'll bring forward the paper to the executive and we'll see if there is consensus. But most importantly, we will test it against uh, the scientific and medical position that we're in. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I think that that's very important. I think we all recognise the impact that if we opened up too quickly and had yes. to close mm -hmm. down again would have on the economy. Um, as a committee, we've been getting really useful information from, from various sectors about you know the things that measures that they could put in place, even recovery measures and support that they, they've been putting forward. Um, and we have been feeding those through to the department. You've mentioned the engagement forum um, and the, the work that it's doing. Um, is there a way of kind of potentially collating all of that so that we are getting the useful information that an experience that perhaps some organisations have put in place that could be shared with other businesses to support them in terms of their reopening and their recovery plans? Yeah, um, currently last week, um, um, BES in, in London, the business department, um, produced a set of working safely plans. Um, and those are general UK frameworks uh, for how to work safely in different uh, settings. Um, and we have, uh, and I spoke last week uh, to the engagement forum, and we have said to them, look, these are the general umbrella um, UK plans, and it makes sense to have UK plans. This is our biggest market, um, so it makes sense to have UK plans. But um, can you have a look at them um, and see how they can be adapted into uh, a Northern Ireland specific context and what can we do um, to improve them and how does this improve or add to the advice that we already and um, that already is out there from the engagement forum. My understanding from the forum is that they've kind of now broken into some sectoral groups and they're considering and looking at that. So as we bring forward papers about the economy and about the potential and the pathway to recovery and reopening of the economy, we're doing it alongside those kind of safety um, issues as well. I have said many times in the chamber here and when I've been doing interviews, safety is non-negotiable. No, and I think it is very important that we have that, that um, kind of collaborative approach that has been adopted through the forum as well. Are you looking for Chris? No? Uh, no, no, I'm quite content. I, I, I do have another question, but I think it's only fair that we certainly... <coughs> Thank you, Gary. John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Minister, for the presentation so far. And can I just echo Gary's sentiments and comments about support for the Department? I do realise that these are unprecedented times. It's become a cliche, but, and you're doing phenomenal work behind the scenes to get things out. But I would say, imagine if you were a self-employed person or a social enterprise waiting for support for weeks, potentially months, having been ruled out relying on the hardship grant going live, the criteria being established, to go on on a Friday night at 9 o'clock, possibly with a glass of wine, to drown your sorrows, to find out you'd been excluded, to wake up on Saturday morning to find you'd been included, and then to go on today to check to find you'd been excluded again, because that is what has happened for many social enterprises and for all sole traders. The criteria on Friday night built them out. The criteria on Saturday morning, when it changed, seemed to rule them back in, so they believed that they had a lifeline. And today, while I appreciate the sentiment around the envelope of money. They're now being told that they can't apply. As you will have, we've all had people in tears, Minister, contacting me. These are the under, this is the entrepreneurial spirit that we talk about, people who have given up careers to go into self-employment schemes to try and feed their family through growing our economy that way. have had no support deny. I appreciate that there isn't an endless supply of money, but how did we get to a situation where they thought that they were going to get something when actually they're getting nothing? And can I echo the chair sentiments as well? While I appreciate many of these social enterprises are charities, they contribute hundreds of millions of pounds to our economy. They are producers, suppliers, they are retailers, and they have been excluded from every scheme to date. And can I plead on their behalf and on the, on the, on the sole traders especially that we do something for them? Thank you. Okay, so maybe we should should look at the issue um, around. Um, um, the, the, on Friday night, I think that the wording was quite bad, John. I'm, I'm not making any excuse for that, so, um, and which was why I asked for it to be looked at again, and it was changed and clarified on Saturday. 
Um, there will be, when the scheme goes live, a full um, checker and question and answers um, around um, this. Um, sorry, I'm taking the glasses on and off because I usually have very focused on these are my reading I'm glasses. Sorry for you. You get a mirror, you can look at me that way. So I can't see the paper and see you at the same time. So I do apologise for that. It's, it's one of those problems that come with uh, being a certain age. Um, so um, I do apologise for that. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not hiding away from that at all, and I don't excuse that. So I, I was disappointed by that. So I'm not I'm not hiding away from that. But tonight, when you go on six o'clock, as the scheme goes live, there'll be a full eligibility criteria. There'll be a full um, uh, set of questions and answers, um, and firms will uh, be in no doubt uh, about who or can uh, who can or cannot uh, employ or apply. So in Northern Ireland, um, about um, fifty three thousand businesses are not registered for PAYE or VAT. Some of these will have um, been um, are, are eligible um, to apply for 10 or, tw or 25k grant schemes. There's no, you know, that, that doesn't depend on, on, on what they're doing. Many of them um, will be eligible um, for the self-employed um, scheme. And no matter what you think about how late that has come on stream, and it has come on stream late, um, many of those people will be eligible for the self-employed scheme. As I said, we have tried to work within the funding envelope that is available to us. That has meant, you know, those are difficult choices. Um, I have spoken and have answered questions about various sections within the community, from mid-sized manufacturing um, firms, those who are newly self-employed, um, firms that employ 10 to 50 workers, we are kind of mid-sized firms. Those firms have, uh, so far, we have, we have not been able to, to pass uh, funding their way. I will continue um, to use uh, the department to identify those people um, and to see if there are ways that we can help them um, as we go forward. Um, for um, those people who are um, social enterprises, if you're a social enterprise that hasn't claimed charitable status, and there are many of those, then you and you fit the criteria of the scheme, i.e. employing one to nine people, then you are eligible to apply to the hardship scheme. Um, that is without saying. If you are a social enterprise with charitable status, for clarity and ease of checking, um, it has been decided that you should apply through the charity scheme um, and that there will be help um, through that particular scheme as well. Oh, sorry. You'll come back around. Okay, no yeah. bother. Thank you. Claire? Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, uh, Minister. I, I suppose it's to pick up on a similar thing to what John has talked about um, in relation to the ambiguity around the wording, and I do um, appreciate that you, you acknowledge that there was difficulties on Friday's night. I, I would put it to you that there continues to be difficulties because on Saturday, to me, the ambiguity around whether sole um, employees who are either owners or directors, it suggested to me that they were included. Now, that wording remains on the website. Now, you said it would be made clear whenever that um, becomes open tonight at 6. There is an eligibility checker, which went live last night, that very explicitly makes clear that sole traders are not accessible to this scheme. And I, I suppose the difficulty that I have, particularly as a constituency MLA, is that I've had a considerable number of businesses who are not able to access any of the other schemes and who are now not able to access the hardship scheme. So whilst I appreciate that you were mindful that people were getting funding from somewhere, it's quite a considerable who are getting funding from nowhere. And I would even extend that to welfare. We have a situation where I think it's company directors are not able to access universal credit. So when we have this line trotted out by the UK government that no one will be left behind, unfortunately, we're not even supporting people on a welfare basis um, in, in relation to some of the supports that are coming through, through from COVID. Their income has stopped overnight, and nor are they getting any sort of state benefit. So I suppose what I, I do appreciate the, the concern around the money, and you don't have uh, an infinite pot of cash to be able to 
to, you know, to, to help everyone. But where I have a difficulty as well, as well, Chair, is that some people, and I don't, um, I, I don't criticise them for this, are getting bites of two pies. Mm -hmm. So they are getting more than one grant, and then we have a situation where people are getting none, not even welfare. So what I would ask you to do, and I, I do think there may be opportunity with the June monitoring round, I would hope it would come sooner than that, but I understand the, the, the budgetary pressures, is that we actually get to a situation, maybe the department could open up an online portal and seek um, uh, people to get in touch who haven't had any support up until now, so we can see how far that extends. And it concerns me that it will extend quite far. Um, just to give you an example, even in terms of the hardship fund, and it kind of puts on to another point that I, I want to raise, Chair, in relation to the 12-month the rate holiday, and I had to question the Finance Minister about this yesterday. So there are some small businesses, um, just owners, who they're the only employee. They won't be able to access the hardship fund, nor will they get the support of the 12-month rate relief because they pay domestic rates. Now, this includes guest houses. Now, uh, Robert, I think it's Generic, I mean, we know who that minister is more than I do, on the 6th of May tw uh, 2020, uh, for the UK government announced that B&Bs who pay domestic rates will be supported. Now, I appreciate that maybe just for England and Wales, but I think that's something the department needs to look at for Northern Ireland. And I do recognise rates come under the, the Department of Finance, but in a lot of these cases, it's businesses. And the businesses that seem to be most affected are those that underpin our tourism. Um, so what I would ask to you is maybe conversations that need to happen with the fin finance minister and the wider executive to ensure that that 12-month rate relief is not just for non-domestic paying businesses. I don't know how you do that. Again, there may need to be some sort of uh, call for uh, businesses to come forward and, and, and make their case be heard. So just to give you an example, I have a constituent in my, in my um, in constituency who um, runs a guest house, have, has only been doing it for two years, so isn't eligible for the self-employment, um, pays domestic rates because it's her home. Um, so she isn't, um, can't access any of the small business rate relief uh, grant supports either, and I don't think can, there's anything else for her. Her business is inevitably going to go to the wall, as are so many others. The other point that I would make as well is childminders. Um, the Minister of Finance yesterday said that childcare providers um, would uh, would be exempt or, or would be exempt from rates for the, the rest of the financial year. However, that only is childcare providers within a facility in which they pay business rates. So, you know, is, is, is the majority of our childcare providers child minors at home in, in their own homes where they're paying domestic rates? I do appreciate all the supports that have um, come forward up until now, and I recognise it will help so many, but it really concerns me that it's not helping quite a lot of others. And, you know, it, even more worryingly so, they can't access anything. Um, so, I suppose that, and my kind of final ask, because you talked about it from the outset, but we haven't really heard too much of it since, is a discretionary fund. Let's look at people's individual needs. Let's understand why they haven't been able to access anything up until now. And let's see if we can provide a pot of money that looks at you know, how we can support them. Because the point of all this um, support, from my understanding, was to keep them ticking over until this situation moved. But we've kind of moved on from that now, because... Businesses um, are still going to go to the wall if we don't try and support them moving forward. And I do worry it's the small businesses and the ones that really do underpin our economy. We're, we're an SME economy and it's a lot of these you know, sole traders that, that need the support. Thank you. Right. Um, so I, I, I certainly will take back your idea on um, the portal. I'm not... Um, and our, our, we, we could call for evidence from different sources. We can certainly do that. Um, the issue of uh, small B and Bs who do not pay domestic rates, um, and the issue of childminders certainly will pass those on as issues to the finance minister okay. to look at. I'm not pretending I understand the categories that you know every individual business is, is given within the rating system. So I certainly I certainly will um, as, as as issues. The idea in terms of of those that uh, relief was extended to was to try to get to a broad mass of people who had been told that their business had to close. So 
um, for um, non-essential retail. I mean, your business has had to close. And I, I had a call, um, Claire, with um, a variety of businesses from the North Coast mm -hmm. um, on Friday of mm -hmm. last week, um, including some uh, very big retail businesses mm -hmm. in, in the area. Um, and they were indicating that actually for them, um, they really needed to have some security around the rates issue because this was something that they just couldn't get to. Mm -hmm. um, because that, you know, you you and I know that the the situation they had um, been told to close. They had no means of selling product, um, and um, much of their summer stock um, has a very limited. Um, shelf life or hanger life or whatever way you want to say it so um, th those businesses were really keen um, that rate relief was extended to them and I think that the executive um, has um, you know had, a, had a, a fairly fair and to be fair to the finance minister also a well evidenced um, rationale um, for how and why those sectors uh, would be supported. And obviously airports were really mm. important as well because they will continue to go through a really tough period um, until we are uh, able to sort out um, the issue of travel safely um, mm. for the future. So there was a rationale, there was a lot of work mm. done to provide that rationale for why these sectors would be supported in the longer term. Um, and that giving out the additional um, help um, with for everyone for a month was allowing people who were gradually mm -hmm. opening up to see where they were mm -hmm. in, in the system, um, but that for many tourism bars, restaurants, etc., that they that because they'd be further down the line, they needed more support, um, and there was a lot of work done around that. Um, I certainly, um, I mean, one of the things as a minister responsible for tourism. I want to see our network of B&Bs mm -hmm. survive. Mm -hmm. So I will look at that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Because they, they, are, they are so important. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I very much welcome the rates relief. And I know you had done a lot of work in, in trying to get that extended to 12 months. But I suppose my purpose of raising it is when I had raised it with the minister yesterday, he says those businesses that don't qualify should apply for hardship. But I can't get back in to tell him that they're now not eligible. So I suppose the point I'm trying to make is, is that we really do need to find, I, I think the next step is a discretionary fund, and we start that by identifying those businesses who haven't gotten anything. And the only way to do that is to put a call out <coughs> to those businesses and ask them to come forward and then uh, do some sort of assessment of that information and then provide that fund so that we truly you know, support everyone. Because I don't think it's one or two, to be fair, Minister. I think it's quite a considerable um, number, and I, I, I know you want to support them, and I know money will be difficult, so I think we need to find a way to do that. It, it is really about the funding envelope yeah. um, and about how, how we distribute to as many. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really quite keen that we try to be fair yeah. and get to as many as we can within the envelope that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you for your questions and answers thus far. Or answers thus far. Uh, you said earlier that you were thinking of me when you were signing off on the student hardship fund because I took every opportunity to ask you about it. You'll be glad to know of a new cause. Uh, and, and, and it echoes what has been said around the room thus far, and it is sole traders. Um, the, the hopes were raised in regards to the 10,000 fund, they were told no. The hopes were raised to the 25,000 fund, mm. and they were told no. Mm. Self employment scheme, they were told no. And their last chance saloon was really uh, the hardship fund, and now they've been told no again. Now, I know you have covered this point several times, uh, and I accept there's budgetary constraints in all of these things, but when you prioritise one sector, another sector then feeds that they're not a priority, and I'm not saying that is the case. But from the very outset of the scheme, it has went poorly. From the initial launch, you've accepted yourself that there was poor wording in terms of the uh, initial press re release or, or, or documentation around it. We have had false starts in terms of the launch of, of the website as well. So th th there's a sector of our business uh, community out there who feel very disappointed and very let down. And I think we have to, whether it's the Department of the Economy, or collectively as the executive, has to step forward and, and offer them support. So I, I would just urge you uh, to take on board what has been said around the table today and to bring forward some form of uh, support for show traders and those who have been left behind. 
Um, and I don't want to go over mm -hmm. old ground. I don't think that that's, that's really constructive for us. Um, but just to say, you know, many people who are sole traders can access self-employed support. Many people who are sole traders have accessed the 10K grants because um, they ha are um, in, in a building uh, that, that was suitable and operating from premises that can do that. Um, so it's not an easily um, and, and homogeneous group. It's not, it's not an, an, you know, it's used as a phrase. <coughs> There are many categories within that, um, and uh, even those sole traders, there are sole traders who uh, identify themselves legally as sole traders who employ people, um, who can um, actually access the hardship fund as well. So there are lots of categories within so, so the sole trader group, um, and we've been kind of using it as a catch-all, but you know we need to, to look at, at, at those, those variations. And as I said before, and um, I am grateful for the help and support that executive colleagues have been in um, ensuring that money goes out to businesses. Um, and no matter how imperfectly that has been done, um, it has um, a lot of support has gone out into the business community. And I've been contacted personally by a lot of businesses who um, are grateful for that support and uh, grateful for the way that uh, collectively um, we have gone about our business of trying to, to help in extraordinary circumstances. Um, so, um, you know, I, I just say that, you know, we have a funding envelope um, and, and, and that's, that's where we're at. That doesn't mean, as I think Ms Clare said, that there will be a June monitoring round, um, but on that as well, we want to identify funds that we will need to continue to support businesses um, to help them, um, you know, who, who are, are, to help see them into the next stage of, of their recovery as well. So there's a lot of pressure um, on the, the funds that are available. Um, for, for for the different sectors. I'm not saying that that in any shape or form minimises the distress um, that many people feel. Pardon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Minister, for coming today. And We do appreciate all the work you've done since you've got into post. It's been straight into the deep end, and you've, you've put in many long hours. And, and the staff within the Economy Department, I think, deserve recognition, and the LPS, um, yes. people who have worked with us. I think we record our thanks to both of those who have worked. We're getting emails at all hours of the night and we're glad to see them and uh, we appreciate the work they're doing over the weekends as well. So I think it's important we record that. As a committee, we've worked well together since we got going here and we I fully endorse the comments of other members made today. Um, the points John made about in the micro business, um, the hardship fund. I'm not going to go over it all, but the points are well made. There was <coughs> mixed messages. I got caught up in them, and I was celebrating with some people on Fred on Saturday, when I saw on Saturday the 16th um, information that was put up onto the NI business website, and I thought this is great. The sole traders are in, but I've had a terrible sinking feeling since. And I've been totally honest with you. A lot of people have been on to me about it, and. Uh, Good people like architects, photographers, physiotherapists, people that work from home, people that tutor, people that own small businesses have looked to the hardship fund and are so disappointed. So just endorse what has been said, really. I would also emphasise that there are other gaps and have talked to yourself about it, but just for the benefit of the committee, there, there are those um, businesses like larger estate agents, solicitors, communication companies, they have an NAV of excess of 15k, and they have been excluded from the 10k, and they're not eligible for the 25k. That's that's an issue. Um, we've also small engineering businesses and even printers. Um, these would argue they should be included in the 25k. They're presently not. They're subject to industrial D rating, and of an NAV in excess of 15k. So they're they've missed out as well. And um, the other point that I've laboured, I suppose, a number of times with you, talked to you is about the golf clubs and the leisure, you know, centres. They have been arguing that they should be in the 25k, and I know um, they have. They're going to suffer a loss 
for a long time because business is not going to be as usual for them. But I would just emphasise those issues and underline the points made. My moving on um, in relation to Brexit, I understand uh, there will be further developments in the protocols. Perhaps you could uh, update us on how it's going to affect business within Northern Ireland. Um, so, first of all, um, in relation, I mean, we've, we've been round the houses on, yeah. on the grant, so I'm, I'm not going to continue um, to say the same thing, uh, other than to say the parameters were drawn and agreed by the executive. We looked at different um, avenues and ways of doing this. We pretty much mirrored the systems uh, throughout other parts of the United Kingdom, um, and we will continue to look at the opportunities um, to help those who have not been helped thus far. In terms of Brexit, um, my understanding is uh, that um, the government, I think, I'm not sure which member of the government it is, but uh, the government will be making a, a statement in the House today um, in relation uh, to the operation of the protocol. Um, I um, haven't read and don't know what they're, they're going to say, so I, I, I'm not in a position to, to say. Um, but what would I like them to say? Um, and uh, so that's that's an entirely different thing. So I would like to see us um, to get some more certainty around what unfettered access um, to our market uh, in GB is. Um, I think that, um, and, and people in this room will have different views on Brexit, um, but I think that we all now have to say that um, since Brexit is a reality, our issue is in placing Northern Ireland in the best place that we can do in order uh, to ensure that our economy is vibrant, lively and, and recovers well. So um, I would like to see um, the unfettered access issue addressed. I think it's really important for our firms um, that we don't add complexity and cost to their trading um, arrangements uh, within uh, the GB market, and that is an absolute central core and priority for me as we go forward. Um, I have done a significant amount of work um, with um, government um, on uh, goods coming from GB to NI and what uh, those at-risk goods and how we could categorise those at-risk goods. So I have made it clear that I think uh, that our government should be um, looking at um, goods, for example, coming uh, from uh, Scotland to su supplier supermarkets. Those goods are not at risk of going into the single market, um, so they should not be treated uh, any differently to any other goods that are within the United Kingdom's internal market. Um, so, and again, those goods that are necessary and essential, so chemicals, medicines, and so on, those are not at risk of, of going into the single market. Um, so they should be um, done. Now, I've had uh, the support of the rest of the um, co executive colleagues in relation to this. Um, and not only have I been talking to government, but I, I understand um, that uh, the First and Deputy First Ministers have written along the lines uh, that we've requested uh, around the at-risk goods process. So I would like us to see uh, a free flow of goods between Northern Ireland uh, and GB and from uh, GB to Northern Ireland. And I think it's really important um, that uh, for our firms that we establish uh, those parameters um, and do not add cost to trade or cost to consumers, which is, is ex exceptionally important. I also this week had a conversation with Greg Hans, um, who has been tasked with um, keeping uh, abreast of the devolved uh, administrations on the issue of international trade. And there again, I've been saying very, very clearly that um, we want Northern Ireland to be uh, in a position, and Northern Ireland firms to be in a position where they can benefit from any of the trade deals um, that are being uh, talked about uh, between um, the UK government uh, and different parts of the world. I also um, had a very brief conversation, and we're looking for a fuller paper on this uh, in relation to the global tariff policy that was announced this week as well. So those are really important um, aspects of Brexit. 
um, that uh, are significant and important. And the Department has also been working on the list of legislation that will be required in order to make us ready um, for December. So um, under under the the I don't I don't know how you said under the cloud of COVID, we've been working away at many of the Brexit um, issues, um, which are really really important. Um, and our interest is Northern Ireland how it trades with its biggest market, um, and also how it trades uh, with other parts uh, of the world. Um, and including how it trades north and south as well. So those are really important um, aspects uh, of the work that we've been doing lately. Great. Thanks, Minister. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Gordon. Um, I have a few people who want to come in um, for a second question, so can you make it as concise as possible, because the Minister has limited time. Sorry. Can I just say, um, I have a phone call with Tourism Ireland, which I really, really <laughs> have to take. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, thanks, Chair. And I suppose that's actually timely because it actually just comes in the back of, of what Gordon has said. Um, what we're starting to see now, almost in terms of even how it's playing out in the public domain, is there as the health uh, risks, and, and we're working and, and ensuring that we don't be complacent. But let's be honest, we're going in the right direction. Uh, you're now starting to see an increase in terms of the talk around Brexit and the fact that as we uh, try and resolve issues COVID-19 related, which are going to be with us for a long time, no doubt. We also have to be mindful that Brexit <coughs> comes alongside it, and we need to ensure that. Uh, and, we, and we do talk about you know opportunities when we leave the European Union. We need to ensure that whatever those opportunities are and as they come, that there's flexibility to, to allow for our particular uh, unique circumstances here. So I do welcome that publication today, uh, and, and I suppose really, the, uh, Minister, what I want to get at is. In terms of those conversations going forward, I think it is important that yourself, uh, with the other ministers, ensure that the, the that the UK government are fully aware that we do need that absolute unfettered access, uh, yes. and and we do need that certainty. So hopefully today there may be a bit more clarity around uh, where the UK government's sitting in all of this. We know what they've said uh, publicly to ourselves uh, and and to the people in Northern Ireland. We need to see that in writing. We need to see that. Um, been implemented in a way that is satisfactory to us all. Absolutely agree. It's a, a core uh, of the principle of the work that we're doing, that that issue of unfettered access is, is addressed um, by our government and that they understand that for Northern Ireland uh, firms, agri-food, manufacturing, etc., etc., that it's really, really important uh, that we um, are able to do that. There are any number of sort of other um, more technical issues that are ongoing in the department around uh, Brexit, um, but those are the main sort of big, bigger, um, more political issues that, that 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 we would need to work on. Yeah, and just very briefly, it was just to say on that that we need to look at because I know the conversations that I've had with the likes of the foil port, and I'm going to bring this up uh, later on today. But you know, the, 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 the free ports and looking at opportunities uh, now with, with the COVID-19 uh, situation, we look at opportunities now to mac maximise uh, you know those types of initiatives. Yes. You. Yes. John Stewart. I'll be very quick, Chair um, Minister. Some of the people who have, who have not received their £10,000 grant yet is because they have got multiple premises and the um, LPS are assessing to see whether they're eligible for more than one grant due to the different accounts, but they haven't paid the first one while waiting to see if the second, third or fourth are eligible as well. Common sense would suggest that you give them the one that they're guaranteed to be eligible for and then check the rest. Could, you, could I urge you to maybe raise that with them to make sure everyone who's at least entitled to one gets it immediately? Um, and secondly, just on um, estate agents, there's a big campaign just to try and get the housing market back up and on. The last thing we want to see here is a collapse in that. Um, estate agents are working behind the scenes vehemently to try and get themselves in a position where they can do it with social distancing in mind. Could I urge you to look at that and see how maybe that's some, a sector we could bring back quicker than others, given that it's not as much interaction? Yeah. Thank you. I... I, I um the process that we go through at this is that um, we ask uh, the Department of Health, John, um, to look at the implications um, for different sectors. Um, so yes, I absolutely will. Thank yes, you. absolutely will. I'll, I'll take that away. Dan and I will take that away as an action from today. Um, and uh, in terms, if, if you have, <coughs> for example, um, a particular um, set 
of premises that that you're uh, inquiring about um we i will you can write and and, and I'll, I'll i'll inquire about them okay, i you. i'm not quite sure i mean i'm i don't make any of the judgments and just sort of that, doing, yeah, it's just more of an anomaly just doing, yeah it's just an anomaly so if you want to write them, thank you fine. So two more people you need if you make it quick because john wants to okay Mine's, well it's quick it's just a uh, more or less an observation so the uk government has has indicated that there will be some controls and checks from gb to ni um, based on that, businesses are really anxious to know and get information of what that means to them and, and, and impact. There's 250 days left until the end of that transition period. So as much information as we can possibly get to the businesses and what they have to put in place uh, is really, really important uh, because there will be a cost impact on it as well. And, and also just from a legislative point of view, we understand that there's three assembly bills to, to, to get through. There's six uh, within Westminster and there's something like 80 statutory rules. That's a major piece of volume of legislation that has to go through within the next um, very short period. So uh, time is tight and time is of the essence. So the quicker we can move on it, the better. I don't disagree with anything you said. Um, I did a call, just in a silly aside, I did a call um, with um, the Chamber of Commerce um, and it was a webinar and they had about 180 companies on it yesterday um, and these are the kind of issues that come up um, but the Permanent Secretary said there was one thing that kept him awake at night and that was the, le the, the legislative um, mm -hmm. requirements um, that are... That are, are it's right. massive time, mm -hmm. time is of the essence, we're, we're a bit behind the curve here. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Strategic Engagement Forum Minister, it's a bit of an elusive body, um, which we hear a lot about, but we don't get detailed information or information flow from to this committee, or indeed many of the business sectors we have engaged with over this last number of weeks are a bit uh, absent in terms of the information flow from it. Can there be a, a link established between this committee and the Strategic Forum for information flow? Because what has impressed me about the engagements we have had with businesses the most is Many of them are bringing forward detailed plans as to how they can open their businesses when it's safe to do so in a safe manner. And I think there's a danger of that information being lost uh, between the committee and whoever. So I think it's important there is a, uh, a linkage between this committee and the strategic forum. So um, the executive set up, I'm, I'm presuming this is the forum chaired the by the LRA. Or the SCA, right, yeah. Yeah. So the executive set up um, the, the forum. Um, and to monitor, um, but not to be part of uh, the forum, the two junior ministers um, are, are part of that, and they feed back into the executive. Um, I have a, an official um, who works uh, with the forum uh, as well and, and provides uh, information to it. And the purpose of the forum was that the forum would be independent and not political. So I'm really keen that we keep the forum in that respect independent and not political. It's, it's a, a, a unique um, coming together of businesses and trade unions and, and society um, who, in the common good, have done an enormous amount of work over the last number of, of weeks. Um, and I'm keen that we don't um, and I, I keep it in any shape or form that it becomes political. Um, I um, sometimes log in um, for just to get a flavour of the conversations. But again, I try not um, to be involved in the day-to-day -to -day -to -day work of the forum, um, but um, certainly happy that we share the reports from the officials uh, around the work of the forum. That's, mm -hmm. that's not an issue at all. But keen that it isn't hampered yep. by us, John. <laughs> Supported by us. <laughs> Minister, thank you. I know that you have to be away, so I um, appreciate you taking the time this morning. And um, it would be just useful if we could do these quite regularly as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, folks, um, and thank you for the continued support. Um, we are here for the long haul on 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 all of these issues, um, and uh, we are here with the best of intentions mm -hmm. collectively in this room um, to support. Um, communities and businesses and grow our economy and in doing so we'll support families in Northern Ireland and that's massively important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
item numbers. We are moving on to item number five on our. Okay. Okay. No problem. Grant. So we're going back to uh, matters arising, and Peter, keep me right as to where we got. Oh, 7.6. Yeah. Uh, 7.6 on the agenda at page 198, there is the Department of Finance's 2020-21 um, outturn and forecast guidance and an assembly research paper at page 24 of your table papers. Um, departmental officials will brief the committee on the in-year monitoring round on the 15th of June. So unless members have anything specific they want to suggest at this point, we will pick up on that then. Chair, as the Minister had said, that's kind of the, the opportunity that the committee will have to see how um, internal reallocations are going to happen. The Minister and I think other Ministers had suggested that June mm. monitoring would allow uh, the possibility of new funds to be put together. So if there is to be a discretionary fund, it will be June monitoring that will um, identify what can be put into that. Okay. Um, then 7.7, .7, there's a response at page 20 of the table papers to correspondence from the Minister of Finance on the Self-Employed Income Support Scheme. Um, so obviously that's something that's still lumbling on there, but um, if members have anything else they want to suggest at that point. Okay, 7.8 then, um, there is a response from the Home Office on page 22 of table papers on the Home Secretary statement on the UK points-based immigration system. Um, do members have anything that they want to note in relation to that? Chair, it might be helpful to remind members of that, that we yeah. wrote at the end of February, um, so it's been almost three months, um, but it, it's, it's still very, very relevant. Yeah. Um, and if members are content, we keep rolling that response now of any of the mm -hmm. uh, EU exit briefings we have. Yes, John. Sorry, given that the point system will exclude uh, many of the health workers that we're currently relying on, uh, frontline staff are relying on in other areas of, of our economy and our, and our uh, even our civil service and other places. Um, it seems that the proposal by the British government was wrong at the start. It's definitely wrong now. It's ideal, and we would hope they would return to this in a more sensible approach. Do you want to respond on those lines? Yes, I think that would be well, very useful. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, it was back in yeah. Westminster this week, um, and I think that given the key role that um, some of these essential workers have played throughout this crisis, I think that should be reflected. Mm. Thank you. Um, moving on to item number nine, so item number eight then. Sorry. Chair, just if members are content where they are, we, 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 yep. we will proceed if you're, okay, sure. if you're happy enough there. Yeah, um, item number eight is the LCM on the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Um, there is departmental correspondence on page 147 on the forthcoming LCM from the Westminster Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. Legislation is meant to assist companies in danger of being forced into liquidation as a result of COVID-19. Um, the clerk has received notice from the department that the bill has been delayed again and was not laid yesterday as originally scheduled. Um, the committee agreed last week to immediately launch a consultation um, exercise with stakeholders despite the very short turnaround of time. Um, the committee has written to stakeholders asking for their views on the information currently provided to the committee with a deadline given for this Friday. Um, if members are content to receive a summary paper on any responses received at next week's meeting. Okay. There's a possibility that when it does come, the SCN might actually have more measures in it than we're aware of. Hmm. If we get a hint of that, we do another consultation just to, to ensure that we, we, we've covered all the uh, amendments that are, are, will eventually be proposed. I'm sorry, uh, through the Chair. Um, Peter, I spoke to you yesterday. Will, will uh, the credit union be included in this? This is one this of the is additional members, yeah. additional uh, measures that is still being looked at. The department had indicated in the minister's letter that it was something they were keen to pursue, but it hadn't been folded in with the co-ops and the mutuals yet. Um, there seems to be a suggestion that that is still on the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, the committee has flagged up that that is its preferred route with the minister and, and correspondence as well. Um, and that has also been flagged up from responses we're receiving. So what we 
may now have the opportunity to do because we'll be closing our consultation on Friday. It's not likely that the LCM will be introduced until potentially the week following. That we have now an opportunity to go back to the minister and say, look, these are the, um, the views of the committee and the stakeholders. Okay. Um, press again for the credit unions to be included. It, it gives the minister more support as well in saying uh, that this needs to be folded in. There's also a possibility in terms of ministerial regulations that might allow that to happen, but that seems to be a bit of a grey area. So I think getting it in the legislation as it goes is probably the most important thing. Um, okay, then moving on to item number nine, um, there is an SR, um, there's a clerk's memo at page 285 and the SR itself at page 288. Um, it's the SR 2020-79 Education Student Support Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. Um, members, the statutory rule is subject to negative resolution, will come into operation on the 4th of June. And the committee considered the SL1 regarding the proposed new regulations at a meeting on the 26th of February. And members were content with the policy proposals at that time. Um, there will have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported in this rule, so members will be agreeing to the legislation subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Are members content with the SR? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so the Committee for the Economy has considered SR 2020-79, the Education Student Support Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Are members content? Yeah. Okay, so item number 10 then is our correspondence. Um, we have correspondence at page 304 of your pack from the Committee of Just for Justice. The Committee um, has, the Justice Committee, sorry, has agreed to write to all departments and all Assembly statutory committees to invite any views or comments they wish to provide on the Domestic Abuse Family Proceedings Bill. Um, are you content to proceed to the Justice Committee, to respond to the Justice Committee, thanking its first correspondence and offering a response? Chair, the, the response suggests that members are supportive of the bill and endorse it. And um, if there are any additional issues, we'll feed those through to the Justice Committee. If members do have any inputs on that or there's any stakeholders that have contacted them, if they can let me know, I can collate that with the Justice Committee. But the, the, the response would be mm. that the committee is very supportive of the bill. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, 10.2 then, there's correspondence from the Committee for Communities at page 347. The Committee for Communities received a briefing from Solis on COVID-19 and its financial impact on local government. The Committee agreed to forward a copy of the written submission from Solis to all Executive Ministers and to encourage the development of a cross-departmental strategic approach to support councils. Um, obviously we are here to control us next week ourselves, so... Yeah, we'll get to do an update on that. Chair, can I just come in on that briefly? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I know we're going to get the update from Solis, but if you remember, I don't know if you do remember, probably you listened to me in the chamber, but I asked the question to the First and Deputy First Minister about who outside of the Health and Safety Executive is responsible for ensuring social distancing and adherence to the guidance, and the answer was the councils. So I contacted many of the environmental health departments in the country. It was news to them. They don't have the um, people power to do it. They don't have the guidance. And they weren't even aware on the back of that that it was actually them being tasked with it. And if, like myself, you're getting calls every day about illicit hairdressers and business reopening, yeah. not following these rules, it's going to fall on them very quickly in a massive way. And I think that will need to be flagged up quite quickly to them. Chair, we're hoping that <laughs> those discussions are now taking place from what we're hearing they are, and that there will be um, positive reporting on that. Good to hear. On Tuesday when we hear from them, that's what I'm hoping. I look forward to that. Um, but it will be an opportunity to just pursue that, whether there needs to be additional support put in place. I think, as the Minister Chair had flagged up, um, if we're looking at universal guidance, then that needs to be part and parcel of what the Council is looking at as well, so the Executive Council really need to talk on this. It was flagged up as well um, in our last two letters to the Minister, gathering on what we heard so far. So. Hopefully there will be, be better news come next week. I think we're in that period of pure ambiguity with no one knowing who's in charge of anything and who enforces things. Ultimately we get the questions and don't know where to send them, but hopefully we'll get clarity next week. Thank Chair, you. I, I suppose too with the, um, what the Minister referred to in terms of non-food retail reopening, 
a lot of that falls then within the remit of the, the council mm -hmm. environmental health units. Mm -hmm. So that, that is going to be vital that they understand exactly what they're doing, that there is universal guidance, that everyone knows what it is, there's no ambiguity there. Um, which I guess was again is why the idea of we've talked about this before we've written to the minister about it, the idea of a portal where all of this is available is going to be very important. So um, I think there are um, witnesses from LRA are on the line. Yeah. And so going back then to item number five on the agenda, there is a clerk's memo at page 25. We've repacked there's correspondence from the LRA and its priorities and challenges at page eight. There's a departmental response from January at page 50, an impact assessment from September 2019, and a Belfast Telegraph online news article from January on early conciliation at pages 54 and 160 respectively and there is um, the LRA annual report and accounts at page 67. Um, I am welcoming to your meeting this morning Tom Evans who is Chief Executive of the LRA and Marie Mallon who is Chair of the LRA. Can you both hear me okay? Yes I can. Thank you. Um, if you would like to make a, an opening statement and then we will open it up to members to ask questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Marie Mallon here. Um, I'm going first and um, Tom will um, follow on from me then. Um, firstly, can I thank the committee for the opportunity to present the work of the agency at this very difficult time. Um, I understand that Tom and I have no more than around 10 minutes between us to make our opening remarks and then to respond to questions from committee members and clearly very happy to do that. I'm going to provide a very brief overview of the agency's governance arrangements and then we'll focus on the work of the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum established by the Executive at the end of March, which we understand is of significant interest to the committee. Our Chief Executive, Tom Evans, will then provide a brief overview of how the agency has responded to the COVID-19 pandemic, both as an employer and in terms of our public service commitments. And just something about the agency then, um, the Labour Relations Agency is a non-departmental public body established in primary legislation um, through the 76 and 92 Industrial Relations Orders. The agency is very importantly independent of government, but accountable to and funded by the Department for the Economy. Um, you know, our, our vision, what we strive to be, is widely recognised as Northern Ireland's leading authority and promoting productive working relationships for the benefit of individuals, organisations, and to support a thriving and inclusive economy. And it's very important, I think, I stress the three elements. We want benefits for workers, organisations, and the economy. Um, we are guided by a number of values. We want to be progressive, forward-thinking, and creative, and seeking ways to support the economy. Um, we want to be and strive to be ethical, acting with integrity, very importantly impartiality and professionalism and uh, demonstrating openness and accountability to those who we serve. Um, exemplary in terms of challenging ourselves to the best we can be in terms of conducting our own employment relations as an employer and of course importantly responsive in terms of our customers and our staff and adapting and changing our services to meet their needs. Something about then our board. Um, the board is responsible for the strategic direction and oversight of the agency. It has a unique construct in that, um, and that is prescribed in our governing legislation. We have um, nine board members, three from an employee type background, three from an employer type background, and three from an independent background. And you frequently, those will be. Um, lawyers or academics who have an interest in the industrial and employment relations. Um, a key area of our work is the facilitation of major best practice projects designed to improve employee engagement at a sectoral level, and that's both with the sectors within the public sector and private sector. The invite to chair and facilitate the work of the Northern Ireland Engagement Forum is certainly one of the most significant projects that the agency has been involved in since its formation in 76. We're constantly involved in mediation, arbitration, conciliation, advisory service. But during this pandemic, we've been asked um, to chair and facilitate the work of this and the importance, we believe, of positive social dialogue to societal wellbeing can't be overstated. 
So the executive's decision to establish the engagement forum has been validated, um, I would put to you, by the highly positive work that has been delivered in the past couple of months. The forum, um, just to be clear, is representative of the majority of Northern Ireland's trade unions and employer organisation. There are six trade union members representing the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, six employer organisations, the CBI, Chamber of Commerce, Federation of Small Businesses, Manufacturing NI, NI Retail Consortium and the Institute of Directors. We've also reached out to many other industries, including the Northern Ireland Food and Drinks Body. And there are also a number of statutory agencies that support the work of the engagement forum, the health and safety executive for the public health um, people, the Food UK, and of course our own directors and chief executive um, at the LRA play a hugely important role. Um, the forum is sponsored by DFE, it was set up, um, I was asked to set this up by um, our Minister for the Economy, Diane Dodds, and junior ministers Tierney and Lance are also in attendance. I must stress that the forum, the engagement forum is an advisory body with no enforcement powers um, and the group understands that it's for the executive to accept or reject any proposals brought forward by the group. We report directly to the economy minister after each meeting um, and we're supported as well by senior DFE officials. Just for your information, the forum has met in this very short space of time on 10 occasions and will meet again tomorrow. Um, the group has developed a level of social cohesion and a commitment to joint working that probably does not exist in the rest of the UK and the Republic of Ireland. Um, I have to say the absolute commitment to joint working and the setting aside of partisan agendas and the respect for an increased understanding of um, the different parties' perspectives and motivations is something that is rarely seen. Um, However, um, there, there's lots of debate, decisions and actions are agreed on a consensus basis and that's very important that we go forward um, on an agreed approach. Um, I have no doubt that the forum has been instrumental in minimising workplace conflict on the ground um, at such a pressurised time and we've seen instances of that, um, particularly at the beginning of this crisis. Um, just then to identify some of the projects um, at the outset, the executive asked the forum to develop a list of priority sectors and a code of practice covering safe working practices. And we delivered on both those projects, which are now published on the NI Business Info website. Those documents have proved to be very popular with lots of downloads. We've also produced a guidance document on the restarting of the economy. Um, and the Department of the Economy has indicated that this advice has informed early thinking on how to restart the economy. So the forum continues to provide um, uh, uh, more advice and to reach out um, to industry sectors to provide advice based on published safety guidance. Um, we are independent of government and we're free to offer advice to the executive on any COVID-19 matters impacting on the labour market and the wider economy and that's enshrined in our terms of reference. We have, though, just written to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to seek a meeting to discuss the Executive's approach to decision-making uh, restart plan. Um, and we think it's important that some of our constituents could usefully articulate their views and thoughts um, and contribute to future decision-making with regard to restarting the economy. Um, just to finish, I have no doubt about the value of this forum in advising government on how to deal with this pandemic, but I also believe that the forum has a continuing role to advise government as we start to rebuild our economy and to bring Northern Ireland out of the current emergency. I believe that we can add value to such areas as the programme for government, social inclusion, productivity and, and reducing economic activity. Um, these are areas I think we could truly add value. So I, I've gone through that very quickly. It's important to stress um, that the LR exists um, 52 uh, weeks a year providing all these other services. We're embroiled um, in the COVID-19 response, but we continue to work hard and provide all our other services. And if you're content, I'll just pass over to Tom Evans, who will briefly go through how we're dealing with it from an agency point of view. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks, Marie. Um, I, I, I just firstly want to also uh, thank the committee for offering 
us the opportunity to share our experiences. And I've just met with some of my staff today and they were really pleased that we were in front of the committee. And I thought it might be helpful in, in the short time I have is to give you a flavour of the actions that we've taken. One is an employer and how, we, how we're looking after our staff and two, how we continue to deliver services. Uh, from from, from mid-March, the agency took, the, took a, quite a radical decision to, to close the building to the public and to suspend all face-to-face -face services. We'd asked our staff to, to work from home and we put in place the ne necessary technology and support so that all our staff had, the, had the, the, the ability to work from home from day one. I suppose we were, we, we were curious in that we had gone through a review of our business continuity planning probably a couple of months before that, and, and that allowed us to, to plan and secure the necessary hardware because we were already planning to, to support staff to work much more agilely. And what we have found is that from almost day one, staff have had the autonomy to work from home and obviously managing their own uh, home-based commitments, uh, being, being free from worry about how we contact their colleagues and how they contact their customers uh, has been a real bonus. And then with the agreement of the board, we broadly in the last month set aside the, the final months of the business plan to, to focus on three objectives over the period in which we are dealing with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The first objective has always been the priority has been, and I think that's something that the engagement forum was, was the, to preserve life, keep our staff safe, to keep our customers safe and to keep the wider community safe. And I think the decision that we took not to receive uh, uh, customers into our building, not to go out in front of with, with our customers is very much about minimizing the community transfer of the virus. The second objective we had was about sustaining and, and maintaining frontline services. We are, our, our whole raison d'etre is about delivering services, both dispute resolution and advisory services. So it was so important that we were able to deliver services. And the third uh, uh, objective of our, of our business plan at this stage is about planning for a recovery and a more full uh, uh, restoration of business where we may be operating from our headquarters building. But moving to the, to back to the, the issue of, 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 of looking after the staff, um, we obviously have ensured that they're safe in a physical terms and that they can work from home. But we are concerned about the adverse impact that 100% remote working could have on, on staff in terms of their morale and physical and mental well-being. And I, I'd heard the, the health minister talking about mental health and it's such a critical issue. So from day one, what we did, we developed a bespoke program for our staff. It's known as the Agencies Together People Program, which is seven themes. And the themes are to ensure staff health and well-being, uh, staying connected, supporting remote working, keep the uh, learning, managing the outbreak where there, uh, and a number of our staff have sadly uh, have, have uh, contracted the virus uh, and have thankfully recovered, managing workload and restoration planning. Uh, and, and that has been so well received by our staff and actually I, in, 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 in talking to many other organisations, talked about our approach to that and, and what we've done is we've put our people programme on our website so that any other organization can, can take out of it what, what they will, but it, it has been well received. Our second objective was about sustaining frontline services. Um, and, and, and as I say, we deliver a range of uh, dispute resolution and advisory services. And, and the vast majority of those up until the middle of March have always been delivered on a face-to-face, -face, other than obviously some of our services that we deliver by phone. For example, our arbitration and independent appeal service and our collective conciliation mediation services, which are very much around relationships, quite difficult to deliver um, a, a, on a remote basis. And, and, and this is something that we're starting to look at in terms of recovery because uh, we, we realize that the, the COVID situation and social distancing will be with us for some time. But what we did at, at the outset was to focus on those services where demand dramatically increased uh, due to the COVID-19 situation. And the two services that were, were highly pressurized is our telephone-based workplace information service and also our, our conciliation services. These are the ones where the real pressure uh, came to bear. And if I start with our workplace information service, I, I actually joined their team meeting this morning and they have, let's say, uh, uh, 
have filled in an amazing task at this stage. Since March, there's been a, almost a 60% increase in the demand for the service. The agency normally in a year answers around 18,000 calls. And as the, the trend were to continue, we'd be talking about somewhere in the, in the region of 35 to 40,000 calls. So that has been a huge undertaking. And the level of lost call rate has not increased. And, and, and through deploying other staff, we've been able to manage that pressure. I think the other thing, and, and staff wanted me to say this, was the complexity of calls has increased. With the COVID-19 situation, information is changing, government advice is coming on stream. So the requirement of our staff to be up to speed with all of that information and to impart that information to uh, has, has been so critical. And I think an area that, that has been of particular concern is around the financial support schemes that have been provided by government, the job retention scheme and the, some of the support schemes for employers. And those are uh, schemes that uh, we had constantly um, been requesting information. Our top area of interest uh, in the last uh, two months have been around temporary layoffs, absence, statutory uh, sick pay and, and, uh, and, and the entitlement, and, and we've received an additional 1,600 calls on those two themes in, compared to the same period of last year. So it gives you some feel for, for, for what's happening. And I, I always say that the agencies, by what's happening out in the labour market, in the last three months, 73% of the people calling our service are new customers who'd never used the service before. So we're really looking at a, a completely different de de demographic. We've also been very proactive with our website in providing uh, regular updates. We believe that we need to get the, the information and message out to a much wider population. So we've constantly been changing the information, uh, keeping close to uh, the, the, what's happening in the Northern Ireland Business Info and, and NI Direct and, 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 and providing additional information. I mentioned our other high demand service or conciliation service. and. Uh, in, from the 27th of January of this year, we introduced a new service called Early Conciliation. The, the Minister launched that service, Minister Dodds. Uh, it, was, it was a service that, that uh, 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 it was, um, arose out of the 2016 Employment Act. And that service requires anyone who intends to make a claim to the Industrial Tribunals or the Fair Employment Tribunal to come to the agency first to at least consider the offer of conciliation. And so we were only a month and a half into a very new service, which is new for us, new for the, uh, the public, new for employers, and new for the, all of the union reps and, and, the, and the legal reps when, when the COVID-19. But we've continued to deliver that service and have dealt to date with over 500 cases, as well as uh, processing bulk claims, which continue to come th through, particularly relating to things like holiday pay cases and other case law that has emerged in the last couple of years. We also continue to deliver a very active and, and, and highly valued service, conciliation service, uh, to, to employers and employees where there is no intention of, of bringing a claim to a tribunal. They're usually called non-ET cases, and that, again, the demand for that service has been very high. And in terms of the, the net effect is that we, we, the pressure on the services created by COVID-19 meant that the, the resource that we normally allocate to those two services uh, wasn't sufficient. So uh, the new language about repurposing, uh, we've repurposed and some of our advisory staff and uh, staff from other parts of the organization have come in and supported our workplace information service and our conciliation teams. And we've put in place training programs and support to make sure that would happen. And finally, just on the, on the final ob objective about planning for business operations, we, we, we really don't know at this stage what the future may be, but we have been looking at this at two levels, about how we might bring our staff back into the organization. We understand the, the public health advice is if you can work from home, you should work from home. And I, I certainly will be doing nothing to put additional pressure out on the transport system or endanger our staff, so we will do that. But we are looking at ways, and we've established a, a committee of the uh, a Health and Safety Committee to look at how we would configure our offices to, to bring some staff back in when we would have the authority to do that. And that work is continuing. In terms of our frontline services, we are now looking very much, I, I think the glass ceiling has been broken in terms of agile working and remote working. 
and, and we're looking at what would be the what would be a, a, an appropriate breakdown between the time a member of staff would, would spend in the office working and at home or in other locations and we're doing that. We're starting to develop webinars so that we can de deliver our seminars and workshops which are so highly valued. We also deliver an effective, a certificate in effective line management and again looking, we're looking at ways in which we can deliver that. And, and, and also in, in, in terms of our collective conciliations and our independent appeals, are, we're starting to look at how that might uh, be handled if we were to continue to, to work remotely. We've already developed a protocol for collective conciliations and worked with successfully with one large employer to, to manage a redundancy situation. So that, in, in, in summary, as I say, we've, uh, we, we've, we've, we've sought, particularly through good communication, to work with our staff to minimise the level of, of, of uh, isolation they feel and as I say we've continued to uh, deliver on a very full book of work and I'm going to leave it at that. Um, thank you both for, for those um, briefings, they were really informative and I guess when the committee um, initially wrote to you at the end of January it was on the, the broader work that you do and the really important work that, that the agency does in terms of, of employment rights and um, and the new work that is going on around the conciliation services um, as well. And obviously I think we will want to return to, to all of that at some point in, in the near future. But today the committee is just really interested in focusing on the, um, the engagement forum. All of the feedback that we have had in relation to the forum so far has been very positive. Um, those things that you said, Marie, around you know um, the role that it has played in um, getting the kind of consensus around the um, the guidance and the priority sectors, the the potential to look at the future decision making, um, and the the kind of cross collaboration that has happened and all of that has all been um, really positive. And I, I, yeah, I, I, do, I would agree that, that I think there has to be a continuing role for that forum and, and that continuing social dialogue has to take place. Um, in terms of the work that is being done now, you mentioned um, additional guidance document on restarting the economy. Uh, have we been able to access that or has that been actually published yet? Or? Sorry, if, if, if we provided um, the advice based on um, the document and staying safe, starting the NI economy, that's what we provided. And I understand account was taken of that um, when the executive um, uh, publicised the approach to decision-making document. However, um, there, there was a bit of disappointment um, by the forum that um, perhaps um, there wasn't things like indicative dates and so on, which would aid planning in terms of when businesses could open. Um, on, and on the back of the discussion last week, yes, um, I wrote to um, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to ask if there could possibly be a meeting so that we could articulate um, our views on um, how to um, start the economy. Um, because there was a bit of disappointment that there were no dates, particularly for planning purposes. Let, let me be clear that the um, forum understands it, it is not for them to decide when things will happen. Um, but as I say, indicative dates that could have been subject um, to change because of prevailing conditions would have been understandable and would have been, if you like, an opportunity to plan and get um, businesses ready to give staff, to give workers some hope and also some advance notice um, when businesses would start. Um, and, and as I say, we are not, um, we're an advisory group, we're not saying um, what we demand, we're advising, but we would like to articulate the um, views of the constituent members of the advisory group on that particular issue. Okay, thank you. And I think um, I, I, it's something that we, we've had um, raised with us as well, and I think has been well articulated by, by the, the, the First Ministers in terms of why the why the approach was taken that it was in terms of having the, the I suppose that the, the medical and scientific evidence um, like leading the decisions and um, the natural three week cycles that there is in terms of reviewing the guidance but obviously that if that's something that is being discussed then um, that, that is something for the forum to, to put forward. 
uh, I think that the the um, the together the, the mental health well-being guidance or that what was mm. called together people I think is something that um, sounds a bit really um, it's something that is really important to all workplaces uh, as we are all in these kind of new working ways and um, and all of the things that you, you highlighted in that Tom is um, really interesting and I think it's something that we might want to explore a wee bit further um, if, you, if there's anything additional that um, might be of use to, to you know wider um, workplaces and, and businesses and organizations as well um, if there's anything additional that you might want to say in relation to that yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I mean, the, the issue of, 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 of mental health and, and, and mental health well-being. I mean, we, we've been we, we have been working with the Equality Commission, other organisations for some time now, uh, looking at this very issue, and have run a range of seminars. And I suppose I was looking at it very much from an internal perspective because of our staff all being at home. And, and all I would say is that. The, the, the program was rolled out and we consulted with our trade union colleagues and with our staff and there was an absolute universal a, a acceptance that this is a really positive thing to do. I, I'm very happy to share the document, uh, pass it through, to, through Peter if you want to explore it. I mean, I, I, I don't want to, uh, to, to make it out something. It is a very practical document which sets out a number of steps and, and sets a framework in which an organization can attend to those issues. And, and I think the key here in, 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 in that work is about early warning signals and making sure pe people are connected with. I think in the current COVID-19 situation, there, not everybody is sitting at home with a, 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 a family around them. People live on their own. People have home pressures. So uh, there's a need to actually balance the, the, the work priorities with the home priorities, whether they're caring or they're shielding or whatever. So that, that, that's something. Also, I would say I've just had discussions with a, somebody from another uh, public body recently with a view that to ask whether we'd be interested in getting involved. Uh, Marie spoke at an event which was around bereavement and, and it, it worked about a year ago. And I think the issue of bereavement, which hits, will hit many families mm -hmm. and workplaces, is an issue that we're again we try to work in partnership with other organizations to get our message out to a wider group of people and it seems to have effects so as i said the, the i i don't think you can underestimate the economic as well as the social value of addressing these matters yeah, i would completely concur with that um obviously the the huge increase in demand that, that you have seen i guess was it not a, a big surprise to to any of us, and you have talked about how you've had to, to redeploy staff and things like that. Um, and the point is well made in terms of the complexity of the, the calls and the, the inquiries as well. Um, obviously, we're all having to deal with the, the kind of change in information, um, and it's a, a very worrying time for, for workers and, and businesses, obviously, as well. Um, and just in terms of, of managing all of that in the time ahead, is is that something that you see as as a potential difficulty, or do you believe that the kind of forum that is in place is has, has helped with that? Um, well, if I Tom can maybe um, comment on, on that as well. But just interestingly, that was a, 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 an issue we discussed just last week at our board meeting, um, on two fronts, I suppose, um, the availability of enough resource. And to ensure that we're helping people at the right time. That's very, very important. And of course, um, reaching out to people as well as just responding. Um, because w we see every day um, that um, organizations, businesses, etc., are in trouble. And they need to know that we're here and available to them. But we do have a concern about pressures in terms of resources. But as Tom said, we've repurposed um, a number of our staff um, to undertake these duties, but it is something the board is very mindful of, and has asked um, Tom to keep us informed. Tom, yeah, no, no, I mean, I mean, resources are, are an issue for every organisation in Northern Ireland, but I, I think, I think the the issue for us is that I have a really superb management team, and I think you have to actively manage th these pressures, and you have to look to see where are the priorities at a particular point in time, and the reality is. 
it, it was so clear where the priorities have lay, where it is the public, whether it's employers or employees, ringing us, contacting us, and we've, we've dealt with that. How you sustain that in the long term, we have to look and see how we d deploy our resources. And I, I don't think it's sustainable to redirect a lot of our resources into one service on a, 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 in, in a sustained period of time, and we would need to, 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 to I suppose, retrench and, and, and deliver other services. But we, we have very regular contact. Uh, we work with our sponsor department, uh, the economy department, and the reality of it is we, we have we had accessed resources to deal with the, the EU exit issue thing, which is something that probably com will be coming down the track. Uh, but we train those people in conciliation and also to be able to work on the workplace information service. So it is about being agile and, how you, and clever in how you use your resources. Ultimately, uh, if we believe that the book of work we have we do not have the resource to deliver on it, uh, we will talk to our department. And the department, as I understand, will have a, a number of other organisations doing this. But we have always had a reasonably sympathetic ear, and, and we certainly will share yeah. any of the pressures and, and the ideas of how we will meet those pressures. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Tom and Maria, for your presentation and your information has been very useful. We obviously... Um, looking forward to see people returning to work and, and resuming production and resuming business. Um, and the whole thing of risk management, I suppose, is, is comes very much to the fore in relation to how the workplaces are made safe. And um, we appreciate the work you've done and helping uh, resolve some of our constituency issues. And uh, we, I think we all extend our thanks to your team for all their efforts. and, and uh, the extra workload that you've told us about, obviously, uh, is has been very demanding. And uh, but moving forward, um, who who do you see responsible for? And I fully accept that everybody within an organisation has a responsibility for health and safety and hygiene. But with what organisations do you see need to be fully involved? Maybe is the best way to put it mm -hmm. with businesses and uh, society moving forward. Uh, we obviously have agencies like your, you know, your, like yourself, mm -hmm. health and safety executive, and local councils, mm -hmm. who we, we have worked with to try and resolve local issues and have done. Uh, how do you see them working together, and who is responsible, I suppose, ultimately for management, control, and, and even enforcement on those issues? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Tom, you may want to come in, um, and you will want to come in, but just again, another issue we've discussed at the forum. I think um, before we talk about um, statutory agencies, statutory enforcement and so forth, what we've advocated, um, both from a normal LRA point of view and contained within our safety guide, is the absolute need for management in workplaces, trade unions, or employee representatives to work closely together. Now, um, we know that that happens well in lots of places and not so well in others. But you heard me saying that the existence of the forum and the dialogue at that level has been instrumental in minimising workplace conflict. So on the ground, um, um, th th there is, I think, I would contend that um, it's more peaceful, that there is less industrial action than there may have been if the forum had not got together, started to work together, to try and deal with problems, understand each other's point of view. So having seen that um, you know, being done so quickly, I mean, I've seen good partnership working before, but to do it as quickly as this, um, we have advocated very firmly in our safety document that every single organisation needs to work with their employee representatives, their trade union representatives, not just um, every few months, but on a daily basis to try and nip um, problems um, before they occur. Now, where they do occur, we're very clear that there are statutory agencies and, and the HSE is part of the group, um, obviously. But there are issues around their resources as well and local councils. So the best way to deal with it is preventative. And we know that the groups um, on our engagement group are keen to ensure safe working practices and um, to have conversation with trade union representatives and employee reps. And that's the best way to go around um, uh, to get around this particular problem. 
But Tom, do you want to make any comment about HSC because you're in touch well, with them quite I, a lot? I, mean, I, I think the, what this has done is, 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 is develop new partnerships. I mean, in terms of the safety guide, public health, uh, HSE and ourselves were involved. And I think the question is a, is a very good question about when you get into workplaces, about who's ultimately the employer is responsible. Hello? 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 Hello, sorry. Sorry, something went wrong with my phone. Apologies, Tom. Um, and, and the reality of it is, uh, in the situations where there has been some, some issues, it is a combination of public health issues, health and safety, and industrial relations. And, and as I say, the, 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 our, ourselves as, as an organization, we, where there are conflicts, whatever they are, we make ourselves available. And if, as Marie talks about, it, it, it's for very much for the companies and management to engage with their staff. The, the guidance material actually encourages that sort of dialogue but very much we're here to, to, to facilitate. And again, it is very much the health and safety executive isn't just in enforcement. They, they do a tremendous role as well in terms of advising and, 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 and making suggestions. And again, from the public health side, that's become an even bigger issue with the, 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 the prevailing health regulations and the need to comply. So it, it, the, 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 the simple answer it is for the employers is responsible but there's a lot of support and help out there, and we are very much working in concert with health and safety and public health. Great. Thank you very much both for your answers. Appreciate that and the work you've done to date. Thanks, Chair. Pardon. Sinead? Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, just, I suppose, what I would probably want to ask you, um, there's a lot of challenges at the minute uh, presented by kind of the misalignment about um, the directions about returning to work um, and businesses opening up and access to childcare. Have you given that any con consideration in, in uh, working with your with your base, both employees and employers? Do, do, um, do, you, want, do you want me to pick up on that, Marie? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, on, on the return to to work, obviously, I mean, the the, the issue for the forum is is that it has provided advice and continues to provide the advice through. Uh, the, the economy minister to the executive about how that should be arranged and, 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 and obviously as a statutory agent ourselves we have been actively promoting the health and safety the, the health and safety the, the guy that used for the forum with a re, all other government departments and arm's length bodies so that message is getting out much wider I know it's published on NI Business Info but it needs to be, and we, 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 we're promoting it very much with arm's length bodies right across the system so that it, it, is, um, it, it, it has a, a, a wider circulation. In terms of the access to childcare, actually it's something, it is, it's, it's something one of the members is going to raise, and, and Marie and I haven't had the discussion today yet about how, what will be on the agenda or on, on, on AOB on, on the forum, mm -hmm. but that is a matter that has been, uh, been raised by one of the members. So it will be a matter discussed at our next meeting. Yeah, good, good timing. Okay, I think it will be a, a, an issue that will come to the fore now. Um, you know, because of schools not opening uh, and that, and there will be a real difficult difficulty for for people to get out uh, and get back to work if they have no childcare. Claire. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Tom and Marie. Um, I make great use of the Labour Relations Agency, particularly when uh, giving advice to my constituents, so I, I do recognise the, the great work that you have been doing, not just in, in light of this crisis, but um, throughout the, the years in terms of uh, uh, employee rights. Um, I'm not surprised to hear that one of the most frequent queries has been in relation to the coronavirus job retention scheme or, or furlough. Um, I do recognise that we're, there will be more challenges in relation to that, particularly um, as businesses start bringing their staff back into contract, I suppose. Um, my biggest concern in relation to the furlough scheme was that it was essentially a change of employment contract. 
and I'm concerned that some businesses, and maybe it will be necessary because they don't have the work to be able to either keep them on in some form or keep them on at all, but I am concerned that some employers may take the opportunity to change people's contracts, and I worry about the years accrued that some uh, employees would have had but have now been lost because essentially they have gone into a furlough scheme. Um, you know, I, I suppose when I was advising constituents, I was very um, keen to point out, well, you know, your employer will furlough you or they may make you redundant and what's the lesser of two evils. But I do think moving forward, we have to be conscious of what that change in employment contract has essentially done for their rights. Um, and I know it's all very confusing. It seems it's a very new thing, particularly in the UK. Um, and um, I, I think there will be difficulties as that scheme comes to an end or I'm really keen to see how the UK government uh, develops it um, when they allow some furloughed employees to go part-time. Again, will that be a fundamental change to the employ employment contracts? I'd be keen to hear your thoughts on around that. And another point, um, I think it was um, with advice from the forum that the Department for Economy and the Northern Ireland Executive were able to develop a prescriptive list of certain types of businesses in relation to essential working or key workers, and I think that was very helpful. I think where we will require something like that in the future is in relation to the five-step plan. I, and I'm sure other members, have um, been getting queries already um, trying to identify what step they will be. And I recognise that there's no time attached to that, and that's fine, but people are almost trying to plan on the basis, well, am I step two or am I step four? Um, and I think um, it might be useful to understand why, you know, maybe a gym is different to a personal trainer, so we shouldn't necessarily be putting um, that all in the same step. Or uh, bridal shops, I'm getting a lot of queries in relation to bridal shops, and they're saying, well, I'm retail, so I could be step, I'm, I'm non-food retail, but I could be step two, but then I have contact with my bride, so am I step four? So, you know, your, your last uh, piece of work was really useful, and if there was anything in trying to provide clarity for, for uh, people getting back to work, I think that would be really useful. Thank you. Sure. Just if I could comment, and, and obviously um, Tom come in. In terms of um, that last point, one of the points we made in the letter to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister that we thought, the uh, group thought, a sectoral approach was overly rigid, and there need to be more flexible approach that reflects the diversity of businesses within specific sectors, just really the point that you have taken, yeah. um, taken us through. And, and that's why I think we, we would certainly have, some of our representatives would appreciate um, that interaction with the um, First Minister and Deputy First Minister to explain their thinking and help inform um, the executive's um, decisions for the future. So yes, M my understanding, Tom, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the contract of employment, I'm from HR background by the way, remains intact and, and can't be um, unilaterally changed as a result of this furlough scheme. Um, that would be my yeah. own understanding of it, Tom. Yeah, I mean, I, mean I, I, think it, I think the committee might want to look. There was a, a very detailed br briefing paper done by the House of Commons Committee on the, the, the job retention scheme looking at the UK government's advice and also Treasury's direction on it, and it covers those issues. I mean, I, I would be, I, I think, from an agency, we, we, we really aren't in the business of commenting on the the merits of, of, of the federal scheme. What, what we, our role is, whatever the scheme is, it is how we give best information to the, the people that, that access our service. I think one of the issues that was raised by the forum when the scheme was first uh, introduced was that it didn't uh, uh, cover short-term working, which in the Chancellor's most recent uh, development, that is the case. So um, I, I, I think uh, obviously there's a lot of concern out there about the furlough scheme in relation to it obviously moving from uh, the, the coverage it has up until the end of July and then uh, uh, tapering it off, uh, what, how that might impact on, on, on in both employers, companies and, 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 and their staff. I'm pleased to hear you, the, the priority list, which, is, which the, 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 again was, was published by, by the executive, which is the work that, 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 the, that the forum did. And I suppose that just shows the value uh, of, of the forum that it is able to reach out and is a, very much a temperature check about what's happening out in the labour market and is able to get into the, 
give a very sophisticated insight to how plans should be developed because the point you're making, and Maria's made it, that a sector approach in the view of the forum was, was overly rigid and within sectors, businesses, they're, they're very different businesses and I'm thinking the tourism sector, I've just been speaking, is a, is, a, is a case in point where there are a whole range of businesses that are very different in their operation and would have very different arrangements to put in place to, to be able to restart. So, um, yeah. Um, I, I would be um, I, I'm quite happy to write to the first and deputy first minister raising you know that point um, and maybe would make a suggestion that the committee might want to do it. In relation to the furlough, I, I really appreciate that that that's useful, and I will take a look at the House of Commons report. Um, I suppose to add to that, um, the furlough again, in my opinion, was uh, to prevent. Uh, uh, redundancies in the first instance. I am concerned that some businesses, unfortunately, will have to move to that position, and I know we will need to support both employers and employees to ensure that redundancy is being carried out legally. Um, in that, you know, those jobs won't be rehired within the next two years, and you know, the um, Ray probably know more about that than I as an HR person. But um, I just, I, I think we need to to kind of remain, f keep a focus on it because I am concerned that given how confusing it was, the fact that it came up so quickly, I, we need to ensure that we're, we're keeping within the confines of employment law and we are supporting both employers and employees to do that. Well, for time. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. John. Uh, good afternoon. Um, in terms of, I'm more interested in terms of the practical workings of the strategic forum uh, in a sense of, are you looking at how businesses, and we're talking there about the different sectors, but in terms of how businesses can be supported to return uh, to opening, for instance, are you looking at the issue of uh, uniforms, the equipment that's required by, by staff, by employers, about social distancing, costs involved, and are you examining uh, any financial schemes that the executive may be required to introduce to allow businesses to open uh, in a safe and orderly manner? Hello, sorry, so, Tom, uh, you want to come in? In terms of um, um, the opening business and so on, in relation to PPE, what we said, we haven't got down into detail as to which PPE is appropriate for which business or which sector. But right from the outset, from the very first meeting, and tomorrow will be the 11th, we have said that um, there are real concerns about PPE and testing. And that is part of what needs to be in place to restart the economy. Um, uh, we haven't gone into detail to the Minister, although there has been very interesting discussions within the forum about which different sectors are doing, you know, from food and manufacturing to um, domiciliary care, all of those, uh, and what they need and, and what's trying to be achieved in those sectors. But very much um, um, the foundation for our belief in terms of staying safe and restarting the economy uh, is the need for appropriate PPE and testing, and we said that in our letter to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. I think the one other piece of work that the Forum is doing, um, the, the UK government issued eight uh, a sort of guidance notes for particular sectors about how they would uh, assure themselves that, that and their staff that safety, and the Forum, a subgroup of it, is actually looking at those guides to see whether they have merit and to see whether they could be customised, and we're doing a gap analysis against our own safety guide with a view to actually these could be probably used as exemplars out in the individual sectors because it really isn't for the forum at, 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 at that level to be getting into the absolute detail down at the gut. It is about providing a framework in which people can, can take, because we've been finding employers have been, and, their, and uh, employee groups when they're working together, have been very innovative and very clever, and, and there's now best practice being developed around Northern Ireland and, and wider afield, and, and those practices are now being brought back into workplaces, because if somebody has developed some good working practices, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. It's bringing that practice in, because the, uh, developing new practices costs business uh, time uh, and money, and and so it's a combination. But the the, the, guide, the guides are being looked at at this point in time, and they should give give it, provide a more practical uh, support. One of the 
uh, issues that has been well over this last number of weeks, the, the committee has received uh, reports and have been engaging with various sectors within the business community. And while everyone quite rightly is coming forward with the problems they face, several sectors have come forward with solutions or possible solutions as to how they could reopen their businesses in a safe and orderly manner. Uh, and one of the concerns I have is that that information will, will just disappear into the ether. So I've asked the, the minister who was in before you is that we have a regular engagement or update from, from the forum. Um, and I think there needs to be a, a linkage between the forum and, and the committee and an engagement. I, I, I know this is hopefully the start of it, but certainly given the information the committee is receiving, I think it's important that that information is fed through uh, on a regular basis to yourselves and vice versa, that we're, we're not, we are uh, assisting each other in ensuring that businesses and employees can return safely. Can I, can I say I think that's absolutely right and um, we're very keen not only to think about issues um, that we should send up um, in terms of advice to the Minister um, but we want it to be a two-way street and, and, and that has happened so far and we're keen that that continues um, how can we help and the engagement forum is, is ready and very much prepared um, to do what it can so any sort of engagement any conversation any help um, that is needed we will certainly and engage. And, and, and in the last week, both Marie and myself have been have been contacted by particular sectors mm -hmm. around their own issues, which we will raise with the forum mm -hmm. uh, at their meeting. So uh, I mean, that's where the two-way process is invaluable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. No, that, that's really useful, um, and I think. Um, the, the points are that, that Claire has raised around you know, more flexibility in the sectors um, is important as well. And it's really good to hear that the, the forum is looking at that and raising those issues because, like John says, we have been getting really good stuff through um, and we, we feel that it should you know, help shape the executive plans and, and if we can have that regular communication with yourselves, that would be very useful. Um, and we, we will um, reflect that in, in writing as well. Um, Thank you very much, Tom. I believe that you are, are retiring um, quite soon, um, so I'd just like to extend the committee's um, good wishes to yourself and to thank you for, for all of your work over the years. Uh, yeah, um, um, yes, I'm retiring, but I'll be with the agency for a week, probably the most of this a calendar year. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not letting go that easily, no. <laughs> not going to happen. But I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you, and thank the, the staff um, for, of the agency as well for all of their work. Um, I know a lot of us refer um, constituents to you very regularly, so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay, we're we'll moving on then to item number six on the agenda. We've been all over the agenda today, um, <laughs> which is our um, departmental briefing um, from the EU exit team. Um, and on the um, members will find clerk's memo on page 162 of your pack. There's a briefing from the Assembly's EU Affairs Manager at page 163. Correspondence at page 12 of the table papers from the Assembly EU Affairs Manager providing a copy of correspondence sent from the Treasury to the Treasury, sorry, from the Westminster European Scrutiny Committee in relation to VAT provisions in the protocols. Um, and so I'd just like to welcome, and I think everybody is on the line now. I think so. Um, so I the right number of flex chair. Um, Paul Brockett, um, Julia, I don't know, um, Julia, Victor and Mary, hopefully. Is everyone on yeah. the line? Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Okay, so I'm here. Good. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we've never had, I think, four people briefing us on the line before, so apologies for that. Um, if you would like to make an opening statement and then members will um, open up to, to ask questions. Noted. Uh, can you hear us okay? Uh, yeah, so the line, because I was a wee bit there. Um, are we coming? Are we coming to yeah, okay on the line? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we uh, um, plan to give a short presentation and open up for questions. Is that okay? Is that? Uh... Yeah, that's perfect. Brilliant. Okay. Um, thank you very much. This is uh, it's uh, Paul Grocott here. So I'm the deputy secretary of a uh, head up the group. Um, 
And so thanks very much for invitation. I, uh, I caught a, uh, a bit of the minister's presentation earlier on. I, I think she mentioned the unprecedented nature of the times, and I, certainly a number of members' questions sort of remarked on that as well. I think from a personal perspective, this is the first time giving evidence to a committee over the phone. Uh, and, where we're each dialing in separately. I think maybe you commented on that. So apologies at our end if it's a bit clunky in terms of um, responding to the questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll certainly do our best. Um, so it, it, opening remarks from me, uh, and then we'll, we'll provide a, a presentation from the guys. I think um, you know these are unprecedented times, and, and COVID is certainly taking up a, a lot of the bandwidth. But it's important that we don't lose sight of Brexit, and certainly we're keen to uh, ensure that. Uh, understanding is there that in many ways COVID and Brexit uh, aren't mutually exclusive uh, you know, and there are many instances where these issues issues collide uh, and I think that just emphasises the importance and the priority of Brexit uh, that we previously spoke about. Um, so the activities and focus that we're working on still remain the same. We're working to uh, understand the issues, apply influence where we think that's necessary and ensure businesses and consumers are ready. So in that context, the structure of today's evidence, we were going to provide you with an update on the protocol. We we're going to give you a, an update on where the trade negotiations with the EU are on the UK's future relationship. Uh, and we'd have planned to include a, a brief section on mutual recognition of professional qualifications in that section. So I know the committee had expressed an interest in that area uh, and it, it fits within the set rather than the protocol. And then perhaps through questioning if we could understand a bit better the issues that you're interested in, we'd be more than happy to come back with a more detailed briefing note on that specific issue. Moving on then, we'll do uh, an update on uh, international trade policy, which is very topical given yesterday's publications, uh, a, a, a coverage on migration and immigration and the, the Home Office Bill, and then finally we'll give you an update on legislation. Um, so I mentioned there that the recent publications, all of these updates from the from the guys will be in the context of recent publications. So, you know, most notably yesterday's announcement on global tariffs, uh, and then the publication of the UK's legal text for the FTA. Um, but we're also conscious that there has been developments in par Parliament uh, on UK G legislation, and then also uh, some consultation exercises that will give you an update. And um, just to make members aware, um, we're conscious that of an imminent publication on the UK's plans for implementing the protocol and we're hopeful that this will provide the much needed clarity uh, for Northern businesses. But given that it's not been published yet, there's, uh, we won't be able to go into the detail, but again, more than happy to come back and provide more briefing when that's in the public domain. Um, the detail on all them will be picked up in there by the team. Some common themes I thought would be useful to revisit uh, and just recap uh, at the start. Um, that certainly continue from the previous conversations and evidence sessions that we've had. You know, there's still an acute awareness of the significance of the issues that we're facing into. We've had constructive and uh, I think heavy levels of engagement at all levels with UK government to ensure that the unique circumstances that we're all aware of are understood. Um, and also through that engagement, we're trying to ensure that the commitments that have been made, so principally in relation to our trade with GB, but across all fronts, so at the forefront of ministers' minds when they're making decisions about their negotiating positions. Uh, we've also previously discussed business readiness and preparedness a few times, um, and that is a, a key issue. So we understand you know, it continues to be the case that business are looking for certainty, but we're also conscious that many of them are suffering from Brexit fatigue. Um, that's something that we, we certainly have to uh, think about and be conscious of in, in, in our preparations, um, and you know that's amplified by the current context. I think where you know businesses are completely focused on survival and, and the day to day of the business, um, and this is amongst our, con uh, our, our chief concerns. And we're, we're working hard on both of those fronts, so to press for more certainty and ensure that the support is available for when businesses need it. Further common thread that. Um, it's, it's still it's still with it. It's time. Um, it is our working assumption that there will not be an extension of the transition period at the end of June. And indeed, the uh, UK government has legislated to prevent this. So time remains short. And then uh, finally, on this issue of, sort of common themes and by way of introduction, and, and certainly within the context of time pressures, and, and, and conscious not to cut across Mary's presentation towards the end on legislation, 
Um, but that issue, the issue of legislation, is amongst our, our key concerns and, and certainly one where we as a department and, and you as a committee have a common interest and we're absolutely committed to working with the committee on the legislative changes that are required um, from the first, the, that need to be in place by the 31st of December of, of this year. So that's uh, by way of a, a introduction and a, a stock pick of where we are. Um, I'll now hand over to Julia, uh, who will provide uh, a brief presentation on recent developments in the protocol and key issues. So, Julia, over to you. Okay, so thanks. Um, so I lead the uh, trade negotiations division, so we um, so mainly dealing with reserved issues around the protocol. So since um, I was last at the committee, I suppose the most important development is that the joint committee process has begun. The executive was invited to both the joint committee meeting and the specialised committee meeting by UK government um, and TEO represented the executive at both, so at political level for the joint committee and at official level for the specialised committee. In the protocol there are four decisions which are explicitly for this committee to make, um, so resolving the issues around fisheries and customs, agricultural subsidies, arrangements for EU monitoring of the implementation of the protocol, and the criteria for goods being considered at risk. So it's the last of these, that's really um, one of the most vital issues for our department. From what I understand to date, um, joint committee or specialized committee meetings have not got into the detail of these issues, um, but we expect that to happen very quickly. As the minister outlined, um, she, has, she is very concerned about the issue of at risk goods she has sought support from her colleagues and she, un she understands that FM and DFM have written to UK government on this issue. Minister outlined her, has always been really clear to us about the importance of protecting consumers. So in this context, this means the importance of goods that are bound for retail shelves in Northern Ireland not being considered at risk and therefore not attracting a tariff. We're also well aware the, of the fact that many manufacturers are um, bring goods from GB for processing and frequently sell those goods back to GB. So we need to find a way of um, manufacturers being able to continue this trade. One thing the COVID crisis really has um, shown us is the importance of um, maintaining supplies of critical goods. So the Minister has set a position that these goods really shouldn't be ever considered at risk or ever attract a tariff. Um, we've not seen any detail on UK government proposals on at-risk goods. As Paul mentioned, there's a publication due um, today at some stage. We hope that will provide some detail, but it's clearly an issue that will be very important for the executive and for our minister. Um, the minister also mentioned in her, um, in response to a question from the committee, of the importance of getting clarity on unfettered access. So. The issues for business here aren't just in getting clarity on what exactly unfettered access means. Businesses frequently ask us, how do I know I will be able to avail of unfettered access? Um, so within the legislation, there's provision for a definition of qualifying Northern Ireland good. We really, we really need more information on what UK government um, or how UK government will define qualifying Northern Ireland good and, and that that will encompass all the businesses that currently sell to, not to sell to GB. So those other issues we'll be looking at the paper today on our VAT and manufactured goods um, regulation. So these are issues where it's very hard for, for businesses to make preparations without detailed guidance. You know, it's um, they're too complex for businesses to study the legislation on their own and go from there. But with all of this, we're aware there's really significant work for businesses to prepare. As Paula said, time is getting shorter by the day. Um, so we hope that the publication today will bring some clarity, not just on what businesses need to do, but also what support UK government can provide to business. So I'm aware there's a few HMRC schemes. Um, I have some queries of how our businesses can avail of those and to make sure they get the maximum possible support. This is more important than ever, really, given the current circumstances that businesses are operating in. We're so aware that um, businesses really have very reduced resources from what they might have had a year ago. Um, on customs, one thing we've done since we last, since I was last with you, was we've published a report on um, 
research we've done with customs agents. It was based on interviews with customs agents and freight forwarders that currently operate here. So this showed us that there are relatively few operating here at the moment and that most have adopted a kind of wait and see approach to preparing for Brexit. The key thing I took from this research was that customs agents won't prepare unless there's a clear demand in the market for their services. Um, it was also something else notable in it was that um, it was very difficult to guess an actual cost of what, how much does an import declaration cost because is down to negotiation between um, a business and their customs agents. So there's no set figure really. So that's just a short overview of the major themes of the last few months. I'm of course happy to take questions, but um, I'll hand over to Victor first, just to update on his area. Thank you, Julia. Um, I take it you can hear me okay? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay, let me see if we can get Hello, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, sorry, apologies. Um, I thought I was on mute. Um, I always <laughs> feel it's a, an absolute miracle uh, whenever these things work, so <laughs> that's, that's good to know. Um, I just wanted to give a, a brief update uh, on where we are with the FEP, uh, the international trade policy side of things and on migration access uh, to skills uh, issues. So quick canter through those. I mean, you'll be well aware that the negotiations are continuing between the EU and the UK. The next round scheduled for the 1st of June. Um, we, we made the point when we were with you the last time that these are terribly important uh, for Northern Ireland. will help define how we trade uh, in goods, um, particularly with GB. Um, but also uh, in services and uh, particularly with the EU on services because the protocol doesn't really cover that aspect. Um, so we're engaging, uh, making sure that Northern Ireland's issues are uh, understand, uh, understood as, as, as these are taken forward and using whatever channels are, are available to press those home. Uh, Paul made the point that you had been interested in MRPQs and uh, the relationship to all of this. Um, so those are part of the uh, the negotiations with between the UK and uh, the EU. The sort of the legal text that was published uh, yesterday set out the UK's ask uh, in terms of all of this, uh, which is quite comprehensive in terms of uh, in terms of international standards and certainly what kind of agreements the EU has signed. Uh, previously with other uh, countries, so um, that would be welcome, I think, from our perspective if it was uh, achieved, um, but there is no guarantee at this stage, and it's one of those areas where there is some uh, clear blue water. Um, I mean, we export 1.5 billion uh, in services into the EU. Uh, a significant proportion of that is to the ROI. Uh, and one of the commitments um, that has been made within the MOU uh, for the common travel area is that best efforts will be made to um, uh, make sure that there is mutual recognition of professional qualifications, which would help but I think the best outcome for us would be if we get a strong uh, agreement as part of a UK uh, EU uh, free trade agreement. Um, but happy to, to take questions on that as we as we move forward uh, on all of this. Um, I mean, when we spoke the last time around, we talked a little bit about the distance that remains between the EU and the UK. Uh, we mentioned MRPQs there, but there are other fundamental issues around alignment on standards for goods. Uh, level playing field issues, uh, dispute resolution. Um, if anything, the draft legal text and the discussion around it yesterday when it was published emphasizes that those gaps remain um, and that there is quite a bit of work to do uh, to get to a point where agreement uh, can be reached uh, on all of this. So uh, important that we, I think, continue to emphasize to UK government the, the importance of agreement from, from a Northern Ireland uh, perspective. On inter international trade uh, policy, um, 
you'll be aware that the trade negotiations between the UK and the US have now commenced. Uh, the opening round was concluded uh, last week uh, with more uh, rounds planned. Um, there is also uh, a, a public. There has been a publication of the UK's ambitions for a free trade agreement uh, with Japan. Um, in large part, uh, those ambitions reflect and replicate um, the agreement that had been reached between the EU and Japan some time ago, but still has to come in, into force. Um, that uh, is, uh, you know, I think that that would uh, give a degree of alignment um, from a Northern Ireland perspective, but those negotiations still need to commence. Um, trade negotiations with the Australia, New, New Zealand uh, are also uh, planned, um, but they again they haven't just got to uh, an, a, such an advanced uh, stage. We accept expect further announcements from UK government uh, in relation to Australia and New Zealand uh, in the next few weeks. Um, yesterday you will have seen that the UK government announced its global tariff policy. This is a policy that had been consulted on uh, previously. Um, we had in, you know, encouraged stakeholders here to engage with that and um, we, we, our minister uh, put forward her own response to that. Uh, consultation raising significant issues uh, for Northern Ireland. Um, in summary, it, 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 the, the tariff policy offers uh, protections largely for the agri uh, industry, uh, for ceramics, there's protections there for auto, but there's a degree of liberalisation um, announced within it across a wide range of tariff lines. So there's rounding down, even though those are sort of relatively small in some areas and in most areas um, the appetite uh, that the UK government has uh, sort of made, has uh, is to sort of simplify um, these so there, there's more with zero tariff lines as a consequence uh, being applied to lines as a consequence uh, of all of that from our perspective we're working through the detail um, and of course we need to look at that in the context of the protocol where um, e the EU uh, common external tariff would apply to goods entering Northern Ireland from across the globe um, or from GB that are deemed uh, at risk. Uh, so important that we understand and assess that um, as, as we get deeper into the, the various tariff lines. Um, on migration, uh, since we last spoke, the UK has announced its immigration policy. The bill was passing through Parliament again uh, this week. Um, effectively, that bill would turn off free movement of people at the end of this year and give powers to introduce a new points, uh, UK points-based uh, uh, system. Uh, that system would require would remove the immigration cap. Um, but have a salary threshold uh, of 25,600. It also require employer uh, sponsorship and uh, employment and jobs requiring level three skills uh, or above. Uh, it allows for um, added points to be gained for um, jobs being filled that are in shortage um, across the UK. Um, and also recognition of higher level qualifications, PhDs uh, in particular. Um, it also, the, the, the policy approach also maintains a pilot for seasonal agri workers, but apart from that, really there isn't a clear route, um, a comprehensive route for those with skills that below level three, and that's something I think that has raised concerns amongst our stakeholder uh, community. I know that's something we engaged on last time around. And just to conclude on uh, the migration side of things, um, the Migration Advisory Committee has been commissioned by UK government to examine the shortage occupational list in light of the new points-based system. Um, their focus will be within that skill needs at level three, level four, uh, and um, but beyond that from level five and above as well. 
Um, a call for evidence has issued. Um, we're engaging with this and uh, seeking to make sure that our that stakeholders here uh, can uh, engage and encouraged to engage with that also. But I suppose it comes back to one of the points Paul made earlier on. This is in a context of COVID. Uh, and um, you know the bandwidth of our stakeholders is uh, is obviously constrained as a consequence of that. But I, I do know they see this agenda as terribly important for them. So that's all I wanted to say at this stage. Um, if I could pass on to Mary. Okay, thanks, Victor. Um, Mary MacGyver here, and I just want to briefly give you um, an update on the current position with legislation and what the next steps are. Um, as you will know, um, the ending of the transition period on 31st of December really establishes the timeline that we have available uh, to ensure that the Northern Ireland Statute Book is operable and fit for purpose. Um, that statute book um, needs also to reflect the specific requirements of the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and any trade deals negotiated between uh, UK and EU. Um, and obviously Northern Ireland, and because of the protocol, needs to remain aligned uh, to EU law in certain areas. And that's something obviously that is specific um, for us to manage in the time that we have. At present, uh, within the department, we have identified 20 pieces of subordinate legislation that require passage through the Assembly, and around 18 that will require passage through Parliament. Um, obviously, precise legislative requirements, I mean, those numbers are still being identified in some cases, and so the final number may be uh, a little bit different, certainly subject to change. Obviously, the, the DFE uh, legislation is part of uh, very substantial um, requirements for legislation across all departments in NICS and certainly a reference earlier to the numbers that that might involve. So that's the position. Um, so what are, the, what are the next steps, the things that we're doing currently to, to get this moving um, in order to meet the deadline that we have? So officials are continuing to engage on a very regular basis with the UK government, um, just to understand in detail what the legislative requirements are and again, that's very much influenced by how the protocol is interpreted. And also, and Victor mentioned the, the future relationship between the UK and EU, which is very major um, impact on what the legislation might look like. The timetable is very challenging, there is no doubt. And, and our ability to actually meet it has a great dependency on timely sharing of information by the UK government. You know, we need to see the legal intent, we need to see the legal text, and that actually will um, bring us a, a quite a number of steps ahead to achieving the deadline. Um, we already have shared um, some of the, uh, the legislation with the committee um, on a number of EU exit related changes, and we're very grateful for your input. Um, we will continue to do this as this work progresses. Um, and as particular clarity emerges uh, on those legislative requirements and timings. And that is just in a nutshell where we are with the legislation. So thank you for that. That ends the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, Chair, I, I, open to questions from yourself and members now, if, that's, um, if we have time. Yep, um, I think we have some time. You yeah. do, yeah. Um, okay, obviously... Um, just the breadth of the, the presentations you have given us there really highlights um, how much work there is ongoing in terms of the, the Brexit negotiations. Um, the, when the, e, the EU Commission published the, the technical note at the end of April, then the protocol was the biggest challenge when it came to implementing um, the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and I think that all of that still, still remains the case. Um, Obviously, they seen the, the letter from David Frost to, to Michelle Barnier last night and the um, comments from Barnier last Friday in terms of the disappointment, I suppose, with the progress so far. Um, and I guess that all of that presents us with a challenge, and you've outlined it there in terms of the timeframes and things like that. There's obviously the, the major stock tick in the middle of June. 
um, which we know we need to see some major progress before then. So we, we eagerly await um, the publication today by, by the British government in terms of the, the protocol. Um, you've highlighted a, a few specific things, I suppose, um, in terms of the issues that we, we need to deal with. Um, the, the immigration obviously went back into to Parliament this week and we, the committee discussed this earlier on and we are going to reflect our, our views in relation to that again and we've had correspondence with, with the Home Office in relation to that. Um, mutual recognition of qualifications is going to be really important um, and obviously all of the, the stuff around um, customs and tariffs and the, the future um, trading um, arrangements still you know, leaves a, a, a gap in terms of what, of what businesses can do to prepare, but obviously implementing the protocol has to be the, 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 um, the primary um, objective for, for, all of, for all of us. Um, I guess we heard last week that there was a, a, um, likely to be three assembly bills um, and other pieces of legislation, um, and you have outlined there, Mary, in terms of um, the discussions that um, you've had with the UK government um, officials in relation to that. Um, in terms of the kind of time frames that we're looking at and, and getting those um, brought forward to have them ready for the end of the year, what would that look like? Well, at this stage, um, because we don't have all of the legal text, there is no specific date. Obviously, I mean, we are looking at round about June, July and August, probably for a pretty hectic period going into September. Obviously, you know, I, I know other issues and holidays and, 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 and that uh, encroaches on that. Um, you know, one of the, the possibilities, um, and this is where you kind of, you know, look at scrutiny versus expediency is, you know, um, amalgamating some of the SI, some of the, the, the draft legislation, um, which has particular themes if we are really pushed beyond September, but it's, it's quite difficult to give you precise details. Obviously, with, with the protocol um, information that we are going to have released today may help us do that more specifically, but it is going to be quite hectic in terms of the legislation. Um, and again, you know, uh, in, in sort of the not too distant future, I hope we can put some more firm timings on it. Certainly, we know what has to go through but we need to fill in the detail based on the protocol and the emerging FTAs. Yeah, just to add to that, Chair, I think Mary's absolutely right, and, uh, and certainly it's, the significance of this issue isn't lost on us. I know the Minister raised it and mentioned that the Permanent Secretary's views on this, and we, we share that sort of concern, uh, and, and our Minister's asked us for advice, uh, and uh, I think we're keen as far as possible within the information that we've got to set out a critical path the obstacles that are known to this and then activities and actions that are going to overcome these obstacles because it's so significant that really failure isn't an option for this. So uh, we're more than happy to come back and share that advice when we've sort of um, uh, presented that to our minister. Okay, um, okay. members, are... Guy, you wanting to come in? Yeah, thanks, Chair, uh, and, and thanks for the presentations. Obviously, there was so much uh, to take in there. Uh, we're, we're probably going to have to have a lie down and reflect on all of the information which uh, we've received. But I do think, uh, as you're going to say, obviously it's a, it's, it's a big issue. And as I said earlier, uh, when the minister was here, um, it's obviously coming back on the radar. It never was off the radar, but it's coming closer to us. And, and I think that it's important that we, um, we make sure that our eyes are very much on that uh, over the next couple of weeks and months as well. <coughs> Apologies. Um, I suppose I want to just um, speak on a very specific issue because I have been contacted in relation to it recently. It was around uh, the support being provided, but also the, the free port process. Uh, have we any updates in terms of where that is at? I know uh, Foilport within my own constituency uh, is particularly keen and they've been exploring and, uh, options around that. Do we know where that process is currently sitting? Do you want me to take that? Um, yeah, well, they, they an update. Okay, um, so the, the UK government have opened a uh, consultation on free ports. They've put out a, a set of sort of early proposals, I suppose, about what free ports might look like, um, and have asked uh, stakeholders to engage on it. Now, from a, a Northern Ireland perspective, 
because it's being led by the Treasury in the UK, the lead department is being led by the Department of Finance here. Um, but we have been engaging with, uh, with colleagues there um, over the course of this. Now, there is a recognition um, in UK government that just because of the, the current um, COVID, uh, COVID issues um, that it would be difficult for people to engage in that consultation and difficult actually for Treasury officials, UK officials to come here, to come to other parts of the UK um, to glean views and, and hopes and aspirations around all of that. So they have extended, uh, the consultation was due to close in April. It has been extended now to the 13th of July, um, uh, which is the, when it is now uh, due to close. So um, I mean, we are uh, looking at this um, to see um, what opportunities there might be, consider how um, it might fit with Northern Ireland circumstances uh, and uh, look at how it might engage with protocol uh, type issues so it's certainly in our in our uh, thinking um it's but as i mentioned it's 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 led here by the department of finance okay that was very uh, useful actually um obviously it's something that we're going to monitor uh, going forward chair so no thanks for that update okay. thanks gary Sinead? okay thank you very much um for your uh, briefing this morning and um I mean, it's going to be a very much an uphill struggle in order to get uh, to where we need to get to uh, in a very short space of time. But I was just wondering, you know, one of the big things uh, that businesses need clarification on is um, how Northern Ireland remaining in the UK uh, VAT area, but also complying to the EU um, rules uh, and how that will operate in, in practice. And also, you know, it is very complicated. It's dual VAT, and um, I'm looking just maybe for your advice on on what that means for goods and for services, because there is a differential there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you want to it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a protocol issue. Uh, Do you want to find an update of where the negotiations have got to on that particular issue? Yeah. So I don't know. Ed, did you see the um, EU notice on? preparing for the end of transition period on VAT, because that had some information on what the EU expect Northern Ireland trade with the EU to look like. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm concerned about. Which is yeah, it. no, exactly, yeah. So that set out that um, they expect dual systems, so one for goods, one for services. Um, as far as we can glean from Treasury, and they have not told us any of the, any of the, any detail of their plans, they, I, I doubt that they intend to implement that sort of a system, but equally, it's the protocol outlines that VAT on goods, we follow EU rules, but VAT on services, um, UK. So it's a really distinct position. I would share your concerns. Um, for one thing, businesses need a lot of advance warning to implement changes in accounting procedures for VAT. Like, um, we'll all have seen the long lead in for making tax digital. Um, this is, you know, in a, a much more significant change potentially for businesses, and um, we're under no illusions that businesses will need support to do anything. Um, what are the other issues? Um, it would probably be very costly, too, you know, in terms of accountancy uh, mm. provision, uh, not only with not only with certification and things like that there, but but actually accountancy provision, um, if that is the case. Yeah, I would also worry of um, not our businesses would have to continue filling out interest at returns. Um, the distinction between of Northern Ireland would indicate to you that there would be some distinction between sales to, say, a Northern Ireland-based business and sales to a GB-based business in terms of how you would account for that on your um, VAT return. Obviously, the kind of off-the-shelf um, VAT software that a lot of businesses use at the moment um, wouldn't, as I understand it, allow for that. So it would need to be a, a whole series of changes. And as you say, there's very little time and there's been no indication of what exactly businesses need to do. And just, just one quick um, 
one quick uh, question as well. Regarding Northern Ireland's unique status in relation to the protocol, um, has there been any discussions in relationship of how Northern Ireland businesses can still avail of um, all of the EU trade agreements? Um, has that been progressed? Because at least that might be some good news to offset some of the other bad news um, issues. Um, Victor, do you want to take that one or will I? Or? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, so there, I suppose it, it depends on the route of access. So the UK has a program of rolling over uh, its free trade agreements that it has had access to by virtue of being uh, having membership of the European Union. Uh, that program of work is progressing. Um, uh, the expectation and our, you know, is that um, Northern Ireland would have access through that route as they are rolled over. Um, what what isn't on offer at the minute is access through EU FTAs via the EU, and that's something we're uh, we're looking at um, to see well what kind of risk could that expose. Uh, Northern Ireland businesses to in terms of our supply chains, for instance. So if, let's say something is exported, uh, sold from a Northern Ireland company into the south um, or on into Europe, which is then built into a product that subsequently gets exported to an EU FTA country, um, could we um, fall foul of, uh, of, of not having access? Could we become too complicated? Uh, in that supply chain issue, um, and uh, you know, are there sufficient envelopes? Is there a sufficiently wide envelope in terms of rules of origin uh, to manage that risk uh, in, in terms of the negotiations between the UK and the EU? So these are the, the, you know, complicated issues, uh, but there are certainly risks associated with them. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, it's almost a relief to be talking about Brexit, regardless to COVID-19 and the seriousness of, obviously taking into account the seriousness of COVID-19. Can I just ask in relation to the immigration bill, um, uh, which was touched on during your presentation, um, there's obviously serious concerns about the point scoring system, um, by not directly connected to the economy, the role of the economy committee. When you look at our health service uh, and the multi national nature of our health service, uh, it's clear to me anyhow that some of those staff at all levels wouldn't be allowed to enter uh, given the new point scoring system. Uh, and the, the committee's already agreed to write to the Home Office again re-emphasising its objections to the point scoring system. But in terms of, of the wider economy, is there anybody in the Home Office listening to the concerns that are being raised? The first Deputy First Minister have raised concerns, the Economy Committee has raised concerns. Uh, is there anybody in the Home Office listening to our concerns? <laughs> Certainly, the, the concerns, as you mentioned, are being expressed um, and being, I think, made clear uh, by our stakeholders and by others. And um, there has been a so you, the Migration Advisory Committee, which is established to give advice to the Home Office and uh, the, the Home Secretary. Um, has identified um, now stopped short of making a recommendation to uh, to the Home Office in this matter, uh, but did recognise the particular issues of uh, of Northern Ireland in terms of uh, wages, in terms of our relationship with Europe. Um, so there is, uh, I think, you know, and I suspect our, our stakeholders, and of course we will be engaging as well with the um, shortage occupational list, will want to pit, push those issues through that route. Um, and, um, and, and I think the, the engagement with the Home Office needs to go on. Um, and um, it's, it's interesting to hear that you're, you're planning to take up that route as well. Okay. I think just to add to Victor's point, I think the committee's support is very welcome in this, and I think the more that Northern Ireland can speak with a, uh, a united front uh, and, and singularly with a, a really clear and crystal message, both from a political official and also from our stakeholders in the business community, the, you know, the, the more effective that message will be in landing within the Home Office. So, you know, as Victor mentioned, the evidence there 
recognises that there are unique circumstances within Northern Ireland that need to be recognised. So the expectation is that policy needs to reflect that evidence. Okay, thank you. Is this a subject or that we'll return to? I think there's a lot of subjects we'll return to in respect of, of this stuff and once we see um, the actual details of what's published today, um, we, we may want to have you back again to discuss it in, in detail and perhaps a dedicated session to yeah. this at some point in the, the very near future because there's a lot of information that um, you have given us to, to us today. Um, so look, thank you for all of that and we, I'm sure we'll be returning to this very soon. Certainly, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, we'll be guided by the, the clerk and uh, uh, when to come back. Um, but, yeah, please get in touch. Uh, and certainly, you know, when the, today's publication uh, you know, hopefully provides businesses with the, the certainty that we've talked about today and the, these difficult issues, we'd be more than happy to come back and talk through them issues and the next steps uh, as we see them. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> thank you very much. Can I just make an, an observation? I'm concerned. Like, there's an announcement this afternoon by Michael Gove, um, the Minister of the Cabinet Office, and we asked directly our Minister for the Economy here, do we know what is in the content of that <laughs> statement? And she has not been informed. I think that's disrespectful to the Northern Ireland Executive and to the Assembly. And I think that we need to put that on our part. You know, it's about the pr protocol. We are sitting here as elected representatives, and our minister is not aware of the content of um, the Cabinet Office's uh, address. And that is totally disrespectful to our government. If members are content, I, I think that's a letter. Yeah. Um, Direct to the cabinet secretary. We've not written to before. Mm -hmm. Um as as members um have indicated as the witnesses were indicating, so much depends on this mm -hmm. thing today, this this protocol announcement today. It's very it's very poor communication between the devolved governments, um and, and particularly the devolved government that they're discussing today, which is the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I think that has been an ongoing um, concern that has been reflected by all of the devolved administrations. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we can do that. Sorry, Chair, uh, and apologies, I just missed the, the... I'm assuming we're talking about ministers not seeing the... Yeah. yeah. And are we sure they didn't? As far as we understand, from what the minister said... The minister said that she, hadn't, she wasn't aware of it. Did she? We we oh. check with that. No, oh, no, I, I, I'm, I'm mm. absolutely on your side. I completely mm -hmm. think we should, but I... I I think it was disrespectful well, to you. No, no, I think you're well, right. But, 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 yeah. but just check that she, because what you wouldn't want is they come back and say, and well, it's possible she did. She you know, has had it since. It might have been in the system. Yes. But even if they're just talking to her yes. today yeah. to say what's mm. in it, oh, no, just informing her without actually yeah. doing any consultation with her. Oh, I see. Um, the with consultation. The right. No, no, completely, it's, you know, you completely it's, support that. No, it's no, not it's, appropriate. Yeah, no, no. You mean the consultation then really is the main issue? Well, the prior I mean, consultation. The, 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 the minister was very clear that she didn't know what was in the in the, the statement that, that was coming out this afternoon by Michael Gove. Not good enough. Is it, is it also within uh, protocols or remit? Have we ever had any engagement with this MAGS group? The we we wrote to them um, expressing disappointment that their. Um, Research suggested one thing for Northern Ireland, but they didn't actually then recommend right. it. We talked particularly about the dif uh, differentiated scheme across different regions, right. and they opted for a, a UK threshold for right. salaries. Um, we've written talking about the disappointment that we. Did we ever get a response from them now? No, but I don't know that they do. They do that. But we have written, uh, but it was the same, essentially the same information as we were sent to the Home Office at the same time. I just wonder if, if they aren't being respectful in answering us, uh, but I was wondering at some time in our forward work schedule, I know we're very busy, but uh, maybe an engagement with them, if that's possible. And perhaps we should, the, the letter that we're sending to the Home Office, we can um, copy to them also. Okay, so. so if, if members just can give us five more minutes, we we get to the rest of correspondence. Um, okay, so we'll go as quickly as we so can. We've got, so where have we got to the? Um, so let's see. Yeah.
So, um, 10.3, there is correspondence to page 355 of the pack from the examiner's statutory rules. It's the 10th report. Are members content to note that? Agreed. Um, 10.4, then, is correspondence at page 362 from the chairman of Celine Jersey um, Topco Limited in relation to Debenham stores in Northern Ireland. Um, the letter highlights ongoing difficulties facing the company and the impact of COVID-19. It was specifically in relation to rates relief, which yeah, has now so obviously been like addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, do large stores like Debenhams in England, would they have received the rates relief that's mentioned? That's, that's what the implication was in the letter. So that what he basically was saying was that their operations here, if they didn't get the same relief, would end and all the stock would be transferred and sold through branches in England. I, my, my understanding, and I might be wrong, but it was just a clarification on that large retail stores didn't receive the full year. That was a nice thing. There was, there was various sectors did, but I'm not sure if retail did. I want to say that there was a specific mention, but I've checked mm. back. Yeah, it's just mm. something to check on, but it's, not, it's welcome the fact that, that they get support now. If they didn't get that here, then they would have to liquidate yeah. through their English stores. No, that's okay. Because I know, I know Dabbins is also in significant difficulties in England as well. Yeah. There's just expectations raised yeah. among some of the staff, which, which I was sort of concerned about, that, uh, that it was almost a, a, a specific issue to hear. But when you look at Dabbins, you say, well, there are difficulties across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what raised that question in my head. But no, it's welcome the fact that they're getting the rates relief now. Serious troubles. Yeah. Yeah. That's just what he said, Chair. There's difficulties prior to COVID-19, and COVID-19 yeah. just compounded it. Yeah. It's not Chair, will it be limited by the size of the store? The, are, the rates relief? Rates relief? No, I think only in relation no. to um, food retail, yeah. is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. So, could be an issue. The detail on that. Mm -hmm. Just on that, that Chair, could we just... Mm -hmm. The issue of the rates relief I was going to bring up, you know, we had that paper yesterday, which was very good from the Finance Minister, it's just clarification on, on who is getting the full year's rates relief. Maybe some of the other members would, are, you know, are up to speed on it, but um, is it any way relinked to the grant criteria, the 10K or the 25K? Is there any link there? No, I don't know there was a paper published no. by... The Ulster University, yeah. the Garth Hetherington paper. I think yeah. Finance has published that on its website now. Yeah. There is still a number. There is still a number of businesses that will not be eligible, like the solicitors, um, the accountants, the uh, communications people that weren't able to access the grants because their their NAV was over 51k. Now those people will not be getting this rate. They'll get the extra month, mm. but they'll not get the rest. But is that is that the understanding? I think we, should I think we need to get clarified that. that. Clarify. Do you have any further in information on that? The, the, I have a look at that paper, and Gareth Allen's been given out certainly to members. I don't know whether that gives... I think it's important. My, my understanding is, is that it is any businesses that are in the sectors that they have listed. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's not really about the NAV, it's about the sectors mm -hmm. that they're actually facing. Yeah, it talks about hospitality, tourism and leisure sectors, right? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. But that means that a lot of the ones that I've mentioned are still excluded. Mm -hmm. well, they, 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 say the bigger as well, yeah. particularly. Yeah, because um, they're expecting them to go back. Pardon? <laughs> They're expecting them to go back in the work. That's the expectation. Mm -hmm. That they will so be. the ones that are not going to be able yeah. to go back. Um, I think we'll get some uh, clarification. Uh, on that. Airports as well. They're getting the full year. Yeah. No, but I think it's important we get clarification on that. And it's possibly one again, chair, that we can seek assistance with the finance committee to push on that. The um, as you say, the document here was was good and was welcome. I think it's very good positive that you know that rates relief has come through but I think we need clarification on who it applies to. Okay. Moving on then to ten point five, um, there is correspondence from the Director of Source Gyms Limited outline in the company's response to the COVID nineteen crisis and invites the committee to visit the company in order to see how a personal training facility can abide by government guidelines. At 10.6, there is also correspondence from a small business owner um, on page um, 36 of the table papers. Members content that we forward these to the department in the first instance and ask for an urgent response to the issues raised? Yes. Yeah. 
Um, correspondence then on page 37 of table papers from the Royal Academy of Engineering regarding the National Engineering Policy Centre's decarbonisation policy yes. project. The author uh, um, is content for the paper to be included in um, submissions to the committee's minor inquiry on the energy strategy and has advised RAE is keen to brief the committee. Um, the committee yeah. will hear briefings from the Department and Sony on the 3rd of June. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, a briefing with RAE cannot be held at that Monday due to the amount of plenary business. If members are content, submissions suffice for the inquiry, but the committee is to invite um, RAE to brief at a later date. They're happy to do that. Sure, that the paper's really interesting and they've a lot of suggestions for, for the green economy moving forward. Um, then, at uh, 10.8, there is correspondence from NICFA at page 38 of table papers um, requesting the committee, committee address social enterprises being excluded from the current emergency support scheme. And then, at, page, or at item 10.9, there is correspondence, page 39, at table papers from Social Enterprise NI on the eligibility criteria for social enterprises for the hardship fund. Um, members are aware adequate support for social enterprise businesses is one of the issues the committee has been addressing on an ongoing basis. Um, are we content to uh, write to invest NI on this as well? Agreed. Okay, and obviously we've discussed it at length with the minister today. Um, any other business then? The members are aware the committee has agreed to hold an extra one hour long meetings over the next few weeks um, because obviously we have so much business to get through. The first it will be on Tuesday this coming week. Um, it will be a joint briefing with Nilga and Solace. The briefing will be from 10 to 11 and the clerk will be advising members in due course while it will be held, held through our new... No. Well, because it's a plenary day, um, I'm hoping that there will be more members here anyway. At the minute, we're still going to be falling back in our teleconferencing because we haven't piloted Starleaf yet. Yeah. But I think because members are likely to be about, we see how many members we can get. It's a one-hour session. Plenary starts at 10.30, so we're hoping um, we, we can hold as many members as possible um, prior to that. Obviously, bearing in mind the LCM and Solvency LCM, it's in happening. Uh, on Tuesday, mm -hmm. that's now been delayed to probably the week after that. So yeah. um, it's budget though instead. And is all our extra meetings going to be on Monday at that time? Mondays, pretty much at that time. Uh, we use Starleaf once we get it up and running, which means it's, it's like Teams, only it can be broadcast and see more people at the same time. It's, it's like a, mm -hmm. an add on for Teams. That, 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 what, that's Monday the 1st of June, is it? No, on the first of June there is a plenary, so it'll be from the eighth, so the eighth, the fifteenth. Well, Tuesday, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting confused. Sorry. But there is a, that's the other thing to flag up, members. There is a, a plenary on mm. Monday, the first of June. And we're likely to be moving to two day sittings. So, yeah, the flexibility work. It'll it'll work. We'll make it work. We'll make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that is us then. The next meeting is next Tuesday. Tuesday. That's Tuesday. ten. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. This is the Northern Ireland.